Hey, everybody, Patrick Connor here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. You guys know we're about boxing history on this podcast, so that's what we're doing again today. I got my boy, Eris Pina, CompuBox operator and fellow fight history file, like myself. What's up, bro? How are you? Happy New Year, my friend. Happy New Year. Jesus Christ, 2023. I mean, that makes it like, <laughs> dude, I think we've been doing the show since either 2015 or 2016. Sure. Wow. That's a long time yeah when you really <laughs> think about it, we're almost moving on that seven eight year mark man yeah it was and it's man. funny too when you think about it too because we didn't like do live video or anything like that most of it was just over the phone and some of those early episodes are kind of rough <laughs> to oh, listen. dude <laughs> i know which is also i think why we've kind of redone a handful of them because it's like number one enough time has gone by we've learned a lot we've gotten different perspectives but also dude some of them are like that ah. <laughs> don't don't go listen to those you can pretty much just stick to youtube and even some of those are bad no I'm kidding <laughs> no um would dude uh now that we've kind of had a little bit of time of uh, a week or so into the new year to reflect and uh kind of look back on 2022 and everything that happened with the show everything dude there was a lot of growth a lot of new fans and followers a lot of new listeners and viewers uh we really appreciate all of them but yeah, it, there's been a lot of growth, dude. So I'm looking forward to 2023. I'm looking forward to the show. Same, man. Same thing. Um, it's been a lot of fun. Like I said, you know, we dealt, uh, we branched off into a few new fields this past year. Um, got a lot of new fans. And um, as far as the show, it's the best thing I, have, I love doing myself. So, yeah. Totally, dude. I, I look forward to it all the time and it's a lot of fun. But Absolutely. That, that being said, dude, we're we're dialing it back to the late nineties today. Yeah. So I mean mid nineties, yeah, yeah, totally. It's it's not like we're going back that far, but it should be close enough, recent enough that there's some nostalgia for a lot of the people who tune in and uh far enough back that it is history and it might be there might be a little bit of uh some stuff that we're uncovering or at least exposing mm. people to for the first time. But Riddick Bowe versus Andrew Galato, one and two. I mean, dude, it, they encompass a lot. They encompass a lot of the things that we really like. Heavyweight boxing, good fights for the most part. You know, I mean, more of the second fight than the third, but or um, uh, the, than the first. But, um, you know, controversy, obviously. Extreme violence, crazy hitting people in the head with walkie-talkies. We all, we love all these things. Oh, dude, man. It basically, you basically just summed up the 90s in a nutshell right there. <laughs> 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 Pretty much, dude. There was always somebody getting violence. hit with a fucking massive yeah, cell phone. Like goddamn cell phones or whatever, because those things were used as goddamn fucking massive weapons as opposed to some, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah these days you're like, no, don't touch my phone. But back yeah. then they were using that shit as a fucking hammer. But as the as the mid to late 90s started rolling on and like, you know, the uh, the um, crash, crash into the wall type television that just came on, you know, like WWE going wild, Jerry Springer, and just the movies that were out at that time and the way the country was veering in terms of, um, you know, their mentality and just kind of anything goes and all that up until the debacle that was Woodstock 99. This is where the country was going. So, like, it almost made sense that the that Riddick, that boxing, the most unpredictable, wild and ruthless and just unruly sport that you can imagine, of course, would have some memorable moments in the late 90s that people can still remember close to 30 years now. That's a really good point about the kind of the the cultural, the zeitgeist or whatever you want to call it. Like, uh, obviously, in, in 2001, there was such a massive reckoning for the U.S. specifically mm -hmm. uh, that it changed so much about everything that was happening and the culture and the, the way things were pointed and whatnot. But in, in the 90s and then like the late 90s and all that type of stuff, like new metal and everything was like about intensity, you know, everything was just about hard charging and being fucking crazy and wallet chains and <laughs> Jinko jeans. Oh, I had the wallet. Yes. Yes. I had the wallet chains out. Did I, I had a pair of Jinko shorts. I never went that far. I'm good. Thankfully. But, I, but, but more like the super baggy ones that were like three times the size of my like, you know, thighs or something like that. That just looked ridiculous. <laughs> Thankfully, I never went that far. However, I am a couple of years older than you and also white. So I did fall into the fucking mullet territory, unfortunately, of the early 90s and late 80s. But 
that being said, yeah, dude, that's a good point about the nineties and the way things were going. And this was the, the Bogolata fights fit perfectly right into, into that era and with, into everything that was going on uh, with the heavyweights during the 1990s and all those guys and the way things were switching around. And yeah, it, it was really crazy. Um, and also the other kind of like, we'll bring up the kind of peripheral things that tie into these fights and the other heavyweights that tie into these fights and whatnot. Yeah. There's a lot of history there and Riddick Bow in particular, I think is one of the more, you know, there, there's a lot of unfulfilled potential. So there's mm-hmm. sadness in the tale, but at the same time, there's, it's fun. It's fun to talk about because there's so much stuff going on with Riddick Bow all of the time. Absolutely, man. Bo was one of those guys that, like, when he came out of the 88 Olympics after he got poleaxed against Lennox Lewis, there was a lot of questions to him. You know, there was a lot of potential and people were still excited about his future. But at the same time, there was, you know, um, after the way he got stopped and there was already a reputation that he might have been a little bit of a slacker and other things like that, that, you know, there was there was some question marks to him. So, like, when he turned pro, he didn't have the same type of aura that, like, say, others in the past would have. You know what I mean? And um, he had to work, you know, he had to work early on um, to gain traction in the division because you got to remember too, he came from one, he came from one of the last eras where you still had to fight multiple times a year early in your career before you started getting ranked and before you were able to get a chance against it, say like an NABF title or a USBA title, which still meant something in the early nineties. You know what I mean? So Bo had to go through the ranks. Not only that, though, he had a good team behind him when he turned pro. He had a very ambitious manager named Rock Newman, who, as you know, we'll talk about him throughout the show, but guy was um, definitely a little out there. Probably fits in perfectly for what the Wild and Zany 90s were. But definitely a character. Came, uh, to say the least. Um, and as crazy as he was and all the crazy shit that he incited, as we'll get into, um, he definitely cared about Riddick Bo. You have to say that. You know what I mean? He definitely cared about his client. Like, uh, there's, there's some guys out there as crazy as they are and as wild as they are, they're extremely loyal to who they represent. And Rock Newman was one of those guys. And then second, Bo also uh, eventually hooked up with one of the premier trainers of all time in boxing, the guy by the name of Eddie Futch. And by the time Eddie Futch got with Riddick Bo, Futch had already heard the rumors of Bo being a slacker. Um, he had, you know, obviously watched Bo in the Olympics and such like that. So he knew that a guy like Bo had potential. He knew that he was a good fighter, but at the same time, he knew there was a lot of question marks with him. So Futch did some tests with Bo. He said that one of the things, you know, he said, I'm going to work with him for like a few days and just see how things work out. I'm not going to, you know, um, agree to work with him or anything like that until I see that I can gel with him. And so he worked with him for a few days, you know, saw that he had potential, yada, 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 but still wasn't really quite sure. And I think Fudge said that um, in an interview that he told Bo at one point, he said that um, yeah, he was going to go out of town for a few days and that he wanted Bo to um, run this trail that he had set up for him without, you know, just Bo dad to do it on his own. He wasn't going to, you know, Fudge wasn't going to be there to supervise him. So at like the second or third day, Fudge actually never left. That was just a ruse. He just did that to test Bo. And he said after the second or third day, he was waiting at the end of that trail. And there was Bo trudging at the end of it doing it. And Fletcher was waiting for him. And that's when he convinced He was like, okay, you know what? He passed the test. He wants to work. I'm going to have him do this. So Bo, you know, at that point starts developing really well. I mean, in the beginning of his career, he's fighting the same just like trail horses and guys with suspectable records. And, you know, people that will give him rounds and such. But like, you know, absolute guys that, you know, don't really have a chance of beating him. Um by the time the the turn of the the turn of the decade happens in 1990, now that's when his progression from prospect to contender really starts. He starts beating off some of the trail horses from the 80s. Uh, for instance, his first fight, one of his first fights in 1990, is um is against Pinklin Thomas. His first big fight, that is, against the name. And Pinklin Thomas, as you know, as everybody who listens to the show would know, um, former heavyweight champion, uh, belt holder from the 80s, what was the WBA or WBC, one of them, and um. WBC champion, I believe. And he was, you know, when, when Thomas, the guy that had a piston jab and everything, but as every heavyweight back then had a ton of demons. And by the time 1990 rolled around, the guy was cooked beyond belief. So, I mean, you know, but he was still around. And that was, a, that was a good name. So you had Pinklin Thomas, you had Burke Cooper, Tyrell Biggs, by the time the 84, uh, the Olympics ended in the turn of the nineties, Biggs was completely washed. Like, 
So these are the guys he's going against, you know what I mean? But he's gaining valuable experience. Um, the fight after Biggs is against Tony Tubbs. And Tubbs is one of those dudes, another former champion from the from the lost era of the 80s, but one of the few guys from that era who went to the 90s was still able to test a lot of the young Lions, including Bo. And that's one of those fights that I would recommend a lot of people to watch it. You know, Tubbs, as fat as he was, it's easy to make fun of him, was slick as shit, and he gave Bo fits that night. And arguably, Bo kind of almost lost. So, I mean... You know, it's worth the watch. But by the time, you know, 91, 92, he's knocking out Bruce Selden and everything like that. You know, Bo is on the momentum train. And now he's gone from prospect to contender. But you're starting to see, like, you know, little breaks. And not only just, like, Bo's character, but, like, his team as well. That does, you know, they're not that far from controversy, right? Because where I'm getting at is that after the Bruce Selden fight, which was a very impressive win for him. He knocked him out in one round. This is 1991. Um, he has his first fight with a guy by the name of Elijah Tillery. And this is the first his time... his first kickboxing competition. <laughs> Excuse me, yeah. So this is the first time where um, you start seeing the uh, the theatrics of Team Bo, so to speak. Yeah, dude, he turned... Elijah Tillery magically turned into Benny the Jet Urquidez over here, dude. This fucking guy. It's a, it's a decent kickboxing reference for anybody into it from the time period, but... Um... <clears throat> I remember Benny the Jet. Yeah, dude. Like, if it, he was in, a, he was in actually a whole bunch of movies too. So, anyway, I mean, but, American kickboxing was really popular in the eighties and you know stuff like. I remember watching it on TV. They tried to make it a thing for a while. You know, I remember boxing would play. Uh, like, they would have uh, ISKA, yeah, and then they yeah. would have sumo and then boxing for a while. Like that was like the package and shit for a bit, which I loved. Dude, I loved that shit because I was like combat sports. Fuck yeah, let's go. But yeah, um, there was Benny the Jet. There was Rick Rufus. Not the yeah. There was the few of the guys. It was fun to watch. Hell yeah, dude. Um, but yeah, it's uh, Riddick Bow, like you said, his team. Um, not just Rock Newman, but his he kind of had a posse that he rolled with, and they were defensive of him. They were always shouting, always carrying on. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was this time period when he'd started kind of becoming a contender started or started just kind of coming into contendership was when it started kind of hinting like it was going to spiral out of control. And the first time we really saw it, I think in the pro ranks was that first Elijah Tillery fight. And so there, you know, it's a decent first round or whatever. It's nothing special, nothing too crazy or anything like that. Nothing much happens except for right at the end of the, of the round and the live feed didn't even catch it. Excuse me you had to see what happened because like during the broadcast, it goes to like to commercial at the end of the round. And then they come back and they're like, all right, we had a little bit of a melee here. We're gonna have to go back and see what happened. Here's what happens. And they go back. And so, I mean, honestly, like, uh, I don't, I'd, I'd have to look at it again to see who threw the first, I think it was actually Riddick Bow who did it first, like flicked a, a jab at him after the bell. And then Elijah Tillery like went after him and then, you know, they started sniping. No, no, actually, him. I think it was, I want to say it was Tillery. Like they were mouthing off to each other. Tillery yeah, had a I think Tillery was saying something, but then Bo took a swipe at him yeah, or yeah, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And which, I mean, I don't know, whatever. But then it, it devolves very quickly into Elijah Tillery trying to kick Bo. But it's like one of those things where you see, like, you remember the like middle school fights where somebody tries to kick another one, but it's like a kick to like the leg. And it's like the most stupid kick that's not even a good kick. And that's exactly what, and the only thing it does is piss off the other person because they're like, oh, you're going to fucking kick now. Oh, I thought we were throwing hands. And so that's all that happens is Bo fucking clotheslines him and takes his ass. And then like, right as he's kind of clotheslining him and shit, Bo's posse and Rock Newman come over and drag artillery out of the ring over the ropes, like backwards. It's like, you know, thank goodness there were people stopping them from doing whatever the fuck else. They're about to drag him to the car and put him in the trunk or something. Like, dude. Oh, yeah, that was a straight up kidnapping. The way Newman grabbed him by the neck and pulled him. That was something that you would see akin to like Bobby the Brain Heenan or Jim Cornette or something pulling back in the day, <laughs> like grabbing on to like a Steiner brother or some shit. You know what I mean? To get them out of there to or Hulk Hogan or whatever to help there. <laughs> it's like a scene from that movie Casino. It's like there's like somebody fucking cheating at the table and somebody just fucking snatches them from the table, dude. I mean, it's it crazy. Like, I, you know, how many times have you seen anything like that? Mm-hmm. 
like and but that but that's the thing was that was the first time that we ever really saw any sort of crazy antics in a bow fight and it was like they would get increasingly crazy like each time it would get gnarly and gnarlier and gnarlier like what the fuck dude and that oh. was just and you know so that one happened on um usa tuesday fights and tuesday fights was known for having their share of like the that's actual true. And drama happen on their show in fact they sometimes encouraged it <laughs> so um that's also true yeah you know they like you hear sean albert or one of those guys um what was it al albert excuse me um because i just said sean albert yeah al albert and sean o'grady <laughs> Yeah, Sean Grady. When something would happen, like when James Tony was about to uh, get it on with Tyrone Trice, they were like, oh, yeah, we'd love to see that right now. Let's go for it. But there was another scene involving Ridico. So you got to, we didn't even mention this either. Bo and fellow teammate Ray Mercer. Um, look, I thought they got along more or less in the Olympics. There's photos of them posed together and they seem fine. But as they turned pro and they were young pros at the same time, there was a definite disconnect and there was a, a rivalry that brewed between them. And at one point they were supposed to fight, I think before even Bo became champion. And I don't know what, what happened, but I think Mercer pulled out or whatever. But um, there was a confrontation on Tuesday night fights between um, Mercer's manager, Mark Roberts, who was a loud mouth himself and wasn't afraid of confrontation, and um, Brock Newman. And it was after a Bo fight. And so Bo was saying there and calling, you know, he was like, yeah, if this chicken wants to get out there and fight me, yada, yada, yada. And then Rock Newman took over and he was like, yeah, yeah you know, if they want to do this. And he started explaining why the fight didn't take place and basically just calling Ray Mercer a punk, right? And Mark Roberts was um, trying to jump in and interject and telling him, saying, hey, this doesn't happen, yada, yada, yada. Finally, he jumped in there and then Rock Newman shoved him across the room. Get up my face, boom. <laughs> And then they almost broke it in, and you see both posse moving in, ready to start jumping in, beat people up. But like, luckily that didn't happen. But um, and I mean, like, what one of the crazy things too is that, like, I mean, th they talked about this a little bit on the on the Bo Galata Legendary Nights. So I mean, there's a there's a handful of things you can go watch as kind of supplementary material to this podcast yeah. or whatever. But um, that's one of them, obviously. And they talk about Rock Newman a little bit. Um, and how I, and I remember at the time too, Rock Newman was claiming something, he was claiming to have black ancestry somehow. I don't remember what it was, but there was something where he was saying that like his mom was black or something like that. And so that was his claim because that people would be like, dude, why are you wearing like a dashiki and shit? Like, why are you wearing like a, like a Malcolm X shirt? And like, why are you? You're the the 90s, bro. Yeah, and I was like, what the fuck are you doing? And of course, yeah, and in retrospect, there was all sorts of people doing all sorts of wild shit like that, dude. I remember I had a fucking pair of Dikembe Mutombo sneakers and shit, you know, that had like some oh, crazy I had a, designs I had a on them. I had a everybody was, everybody was wearing some shit where they had no fucking clue what it represented, you know what I'm saying? Like, but like, dude, but point is, wearing, a, wearing a Malcolm X beanie and a cross colors jacket and everything like that, because that's what my, that was just the style of the time. <laughs> you know dude I mean? and that's literally rock newman would be yeah. showing up to interviews rocking like a fucking oh yeah with well, that i mean they were nice outfits don't get me wrong man for the time period you know my man was putting some money in on those two but those there was also crazy. other times though where he was showing up and he had a beanie on and yeah. he had like a hoodie and a beanie and it'd be like <laughs> what the fuck are you doing and so people would be questioning him and be like oh yeah i'm part black and they'd be like what does that have to... what is that even what do you mean yeah. <laughs> the guy was fucking wild so there was there was definitely though uh, a fix a fixation on his part where it was like he was like a wrestling promoter where he was constantly grabbing the mic and like talking for his fighter and I mean uh, and doing kind of Don King type of shit where he would totally. Uh, totally. just bloviating crazy exaggeration and stuff like that and almost like almost like a preacher you know what I'm saying like like doing that kind of like talking to an audience type of shit anytime a micro uh, microphone's in your face. And so he became a, a part of all of these, like anytime Bo was coming, like, you know, you got rock Newman too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Good call because you know, that's that, especially after Bo became champion. So at, um, Bo becomes champion when he fights Holyfield for the first time in uh, November of um, 92. Right. And that's one of the all-time great heavyweight fights. We don't really need to rehash it here because if you know what we're talking about, you've watched it. Like, it, they can, you know, uh, what round was it that they say is one of the greatest rounds in history? Like, round 10th, 10 or something? I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where it looks like Holyfield's on the brink to be him stuck, and he comes back and he rocks Bovac, and then 
it's just an incredible fight. But Bo put on one of the most impressive displays you can ever imagine. Like, yeah, that was his best, that was his most complete performance of his career, you know? Um, not only, and he looked like the the perfect modern heavyweight of where the division was going and like where everything was going. Like, this was a big guy who yeah, could Yeah, he put it all together, yeah. And he could fight on the inside. How many big guys do you know that could fight on the inside like Bo was? Like, Bo was a beautiful inside fighter. The way he could rip body shots, hooks, those uppercuts he would land. Like, Bo was a fucking beast, man. And when he beat Holyfield in that first fight, he it just looked like he was going to be unbeatable, unbeatable from the 90s. Like, it was a really exciting time. Even when I was a kid and I wasn't a boxing fan like that back then, you knew who Riddick Bo was. Like, you know, boxing was different. We still knew who the heavyweight champion was and certain guys throughout the thing. Like, every, all kids knew Mike Tyson. We all knew Mike. But, like, you know, when Fila was getting popular, Bo got a Fila contract. And you remember seeing a lot of commercials with him and things like that. Like, it was just different. You knew who Riddick Bo was. And so, Rock Newman, one of the biggest bonehead moves ever, after Riddick Bo becomes champion, because he wanted to make Bo a global star and, well, you know, an ambassador and yada, 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 took Bo on this world tour. You know, it's an ambitious thing when you think about it, but, like, he was taking him all over the world to these third world countries, to this place, to that place, because he wanted Bo to become, like, the new modern Muhammad Ali or something. You know what I mean? Just being seen everywhere. But what was... What, what is the word that, like, uh, I think Ray Arcel used to say back in the day about Jack Dempsey when he wasn't fighting? To rest is to rust, right? And... Yeah, he Bo, became more a celebrity than a fighter type exactly. of Exactly. And when you think about it, too, like... You know, Bo needed to be active. A guy who, with as we soon found out, a guy who was very lazy and had, was, had an easy tendency to, like, indulge on food and other things like that, needed to have, you know, a taskmaster like Eddie, Eddie Futch always on his ass and making sure he's being disciplined in the gym. And him going on this world tour and doing these things, that wasn't happening. Because I remember, you know, on uh, in the subsequent fights <laughs> after he beat Holyfield, and it's easy to remember Bo, you know, after he beats him, they're like, oh, yeah, Bo was champion. That was one of the most uninspiring reigns in heavyweight history. Like, Bo becomes champ. Everyone's really excited. And then he defends against Michael Dokes and Jesse Ferguson. And, you know, it doesn't get much more unintimidating than that at that point. You know what I mean? Then he loses the Holy Field in the rematch. But in that whole interim, he's out there. He's, go he's gorging himself on KFC, on this place, all these fast food places, all this stuff. This world tour, he's not sitting there watching his diet. He even said on the legendary nights thing, if he saw a piece of cake over there and it was in front of him, he was going to eat it. Like, that was just him. So, you know, by the time he gets into the Holy Field rematch, um, which had its own controversy and craziness with Fan Man and that crazy shit, like the bow that we saw in the first fight was already gone. And it was going to take a long time after that for him to rebuild to where he was. Yeah. <clears throat> already we'd seen the controversy, but like, you know, the, the first Holyfield fight was great. He put it all together. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, the guy we had mentioned earlier, Eddie Fudge was, had really helped mastermind Riddick bow and make him into a complete fighter. And exactly. not just a big guy, not just a lumbering big man, which was starting to be kind of what a lot of people felt the heavyweight division was beginning to turn into in the 1990s with Lennox Lewis, who was 6'5", six, 6'5 five, six, five and a half, 250 pounds. Uh, you know, all of them, Oliver McCall was not quite as tall, but was a real big guy. Uh, you know, a, a number of, like it, even George Foreman, dude, he, he did not change height from his first reign as heavyweight champion but he was massive a number of these fighters that we were we were seeing were really really big big fighters and there was the con this concern around the time that like oh the you know, the heavyweights are getting too big the activity rates dropping blah 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 but then Bo comes along he's fighting on the inside like you said uh eddie futch who uh had trained i want to say don jordan early in his career and then moved on to Joe Frazier and Ken Norton and then had, you know, trained a whole bunch of other fighters in the meantime, usually for short periods of time. But those were kind of main fighters. And he was a really good trainer, knew what the fuck he was doing. The, like the sky was the limit for Bo. But then to follow up that effort with Dokes and then Ferguson, it was just like, wah, wah, you know, massive fucking letdown. Um, and then on top of that, comes back against Holyfield. Uh, and it was an exciting fight and it was a good fight, but the story of the fight is fan man, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And that just basically from, from that point forward, 
uh, Riddick Bowe just kind of, I mean, he didn't really spiral, but he didn't go anywhere good. Like nothing really good happened from there that was like over a top legitimate contender who was like a good fighter. You know what I mean? Like he just kind of, it, no, he was just I, kind I, of going I, through the motions. And on top of that, like you said, gaining so much weight between fights and, and Eddie Futch was starting to get pissed off, was starting to get really frustrated by the fact that he had this fighter in front of him who just would not do the work. Exactly. And it showed in his subsequent fights after the Holyfield fight, you know, after the rematch, people were just wondering, the like, where is this fire? Where is this bow that we saw originally? Because he fights Buster Mathis Jr. after that. Buster Mathis Jr. was, um, you know, a middling, very, like, fringe contender of the time who had no punch and Bo was supposed to bowl over. Bo almost gets disqualified in that fight. Yeah, instead. should have been um, disqualified. Yeah, should have been, excuse me. Should have been, absolutely. Um, fights Larry Donald. That fight's more uh, remembered for Bo's sucker punch and bottom with a two-piece, a vicious two-piece, than anything he landed during the fight. You know what I mean? And, Seriously. Um, and so, like, the Donald And, fight like, was, no warning, too. That was sucker punch as fuck. Seriously, I don't think Donald warranted any of that. Like, Bo has always been known to be a hothead, especially during press conferences, you know, as boys revving him on and Rock Newman and all that shit. But, like, that wasn't warranted. That was really, really mean. And that could have been... Bo was an idiot for doing that because that could have easily got the fight postponed or canceled. Yep. Because that wasn't just, like, a... Like, that was a boom, boom, you know? And dude's jaw could have been broken, tooth could have been knocked out, cut, lit, whatever. Like... Jesus Christ. You know, that was crazy. So and dumb. Then from there, uh, he fights Herbie Hyde. And Herbie Hyde on the, in the U.S. side in 95 was completely unknown. His only biggest win was against Michael Bennett. And the WBO title was furious. No one gave a shit about that. You know what I mean? And Bo didn't look good in that mm -hmm. fight either. He was wild. He was awkward. Hyde was wild himself and hit extremely hard. And Bo was wobbled a few times. It was just a wild fight. Bo dominated and knocked Hyde down a bunch of times. But he just, did, you know, something was clearly not there with him. And by the time he fights, you know, his bitter rival, uh, Jorge Luis Gonzalez, now that we're in the middle of 1995, that's when he starts finally showing, like, his, you know, um, his shades of him being champion again. Because he got himself into good shape for the Gonzalez fight. He still wasn't, like, in the prime shape he was as champion. But, like, he got himself into shit because he really was motivated for that one. Gonzalez was a loud asshole. <laughs> so, he, yeah. Well, Bo was pissed off about that lasagna flap that Gonzalez had on his back of his yeah, neck, that yeah. motherfucker. <laughs> that guy had the fucking waterfall. That guy. And Bo beat the daylights out of him. That was a pretty impressive performance. I'm not even gonna lie. You remember, you remember the press conference where they had the plexiglass and oh, they're yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. know, fucking. And Gonzalez said he was going to kill him and threatening and going crazy and cursing and all that. Yeah, he's doing this shit to him and stuff like that. He and then he comes... I had no idea who he was, but I was watching his footage and seeing highlight clips. And I was like, oh, shit, this dude's scary as hell. You know? His little neck flap goes flying during the fight. because he just he can... yeah, yeah. So... Oh, that guy. Yeah, no, Bo did look good. He, he looked like he was motivated to get into shape because yeah. he was pissed off. You know, he didn't like the fucking guy. But... And so oh, by 95 now, you got to think of who the heavyweight champions were, right? Because Holyfield, we remember, regained the title from Bo, but subsequently lost it after that point to the Michael Moore. Michael Moore instead loses it to George Foreman, and the heavyweight division is kind of an upheaval now because Mike Tyson isn't really out of jail yet, and he hasn't, you know, got a foothold in the division. Holyfield... Um, and the was... titles have all been fractured because of exactly. the various bullshit about not defending against so-and-so, uh -huh. you know, so yep. it's all yep. it's all been so... fucked up. You had George Foreman, who was lineal champion or whatever. Um, you had Axel Schultz and, and uh, Franz Botha fighting over the IBF title. Um, you had Bruce Selden about to become WBH champion. And then you had Oliver McCall, who had upset Lennox Lewis for the WBC title, subsequently lose it to Frank Bruno. That's so right. At one point, <laughs> in 1995, at one point, you had Oliver McCall, not Oliver McCall, you had Frank Bruno, Bruce Selden, and Franz Botha as your three alphabet champions. So of course everyone was very was excited thinking Riddick Bo was the man in the division. Besides waiting for Mike Tyson to come back and clean up, but everyone was just so okay. Bo is obviously the best the best heavyweight out there. Ain't none of those chump changes guys are gonna beat him. Um, nothing else like that. So as he moves on to his uh, trilogy fight with Holyfield, and that might you know besides the first one, some people might say the third one might even been 
better sustained too. Like that was a beautiful fight. You know what I mean? Yeah, because um, they're they're both a little more washed, both slower. You know, they're a little more yeah. stationary. But it should, you know, what people should keep in mind too is that even though Bo had looked so good against Gonzalez, you should notice too that in the in the Holyfield in the third Holyfield fight, there was already signs that he was slowing down badly. He gets dropped in that fight really hard. He um, Holyfield who we found out later on was suffering from hepatitis. But like whenever his energy levels didn't dip and he was like still going in and going on, he was getting in Bo's ass. And yeah, like when, really- when that Benny Hinn magic waned, you never <laughs> knew what happened. And then every two seconds you would hear some shit like um, George Foreman going absolutely wild ringside because Holyfield, who had originally retired a couple of years earlier from a heart ailment or what he thought was a heart this ailment. This man is going to die. Yeah, he's gonna be in a pine box. Stop that! Stop that! I'm like freaking out ringside, thinking Holyfield was gonna die right there. I mean, no one knew that was hepatitis that was doing that, which is dangerous in itself to be fighting like that. But like, yeah, that you know, whatever. So at this point now, Bo is still considered the man of the division. Lennox Lewis still hadn't quite built himself back up from the loss to McCauley. He was still scrambling. Mike Tyson, excuse me, at this point has already come back. And was looked upon as the man, you know, the future man of the division again. And there was a lot of hope that there was going to be an eventual all new, you know, imagine an all Brooklyn showdown between Bo yeah. and uh, Tyson. There was a lot of talk and about that. And they're both from Brownsville too, right? I know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have been huge. The only thing kind of holding that back was that Tyson was a Don King Showtime guy and that Bo was, you know, stuck with HBO. So, um, you know, Bo needed to stay busy now. We're in 1996. And the heavyweight division, all the key guys that he's trying to work with are kind of busy at the moment. Lennox Lewis is going in a different direction, trying to hopefully get a Tyson showdown, but also trying to get the vacant WBC belt if he can, if Tyson wants to give it up. Tyson, you can see, is like moving in a different direction to fight Bruce Selden, and eventually he's going to fight Holyfield. Bo is kind of like in a flux now. Like He needs to stay busy. He needs to find a guy. Enter Andrew Galata. And this is where things start getting really interesting. <clears throat> So the whole history with Riddick Bo and Lennox Lewis, real briefly, yep. you know, the Lennox Lewis stopped him, stopped him standing in the Olympics, but you, but obviously had him wobbled, obviously had him rocked, um, and you could also kind of see it. I mean, it, it almost looks like even in the ring at that time, Bo's lazy, like he he's <laughs> he's fighting very lazily. Like if you go, it's all on YouTube, but anyway, Lewis stops him. And then that kind of, I guess, in Bo's mind and in the mind of some of the boxing media creates some sort of rivalry. You know, Bo needs to get, you know, he needs to get revenge as a pro uh, because Lennox Lewis was being built up similarly. And then Lennox Lewis is a younger, is an older amateur and younger pro. You know, he'd gone to spar with Mike Tyson, all this type of shit. So he had some kind of backstory behind him as well. And so long story short, fast forwarding to at the beginning of 1996, actually, um, Lennox Lewis and Riddick Bowe had preliminarily agreed to meet somewhere at the end of the year. Um, mm-hmm. But Riddick Bowe had to get through Andrew Galata. And so basically that was the, ing- the agreement, I guess, was that, you know, uh, Bowe was supposed to get into shape and then beat Galata. And then if he beat, beat Galata some, somewhere toward the end of the year, Lennox Lewis and Bowe were going to fight. So fine. Uh, they schedule the Galata fight and the entire story there going in to the fight was that Bo had ballooned up in weight. Uh, he had gotten his weight down, but he had gotten his weight down to like 255. So it was like, you know, that was him getting into shape for this fight. And his entire thing was that he didn't, he didn't feel up for it, that he didn't, he was looking right past Galata. He didn't think Galata was shit. He wanted to fight Lennox Lewis. Uh, so he he wasn't going to bother training or doing much for Galata and much to the chagrin of Eddie Futch. Eddie Futch was pissed because Eddie Futch knew, you know, that this was not somebody to be trifled with. Not to say that Eddie Futch had the inside track on who Andrew Galata was because he was fairly unknown in the U.S., but Eddie Futch was just not stupid. You know what I mean? Like you you got a guy who's not in shape who's looking past a certain fight. And then you have another guy over here who's undefeated, has a high knockout percentage, Olympic experience, good amateur, et cetera. You know, like that's why would you overlook that? But Riddick Bo did. Um, 
And so Andrew Galata, again, somewhat unknown, but briefly his story, and they kind of went into a little bit in this in the Legendary Knights, but this is, I, I had to look it up myself because I didn't know, and his Wikipedia page and all that type of shit doesn't say nothing. But he was raised by his aunt and uncle in Warsaw, Poland, in a fairly rough neighborhood in Warsaw, apparently, because his parents had divorced when he was really young, and I don't know specifically what happened, but he wound up having to live with relatives. Uh, he was always getting into trouble. He was a big kid, and so he was getting teased a lot, too, because he had a bad stutter. And so as a kid, he he stuttered really badly, and that led to a bunch of fights, I guess. And so he was known as something of a street fighter or somebody who would quickly get into fights. It was a hothead or whatever. Um, and what, what actually wound up happening was he was a really good amateur. He was a very good amateur fighter and had gone to the Olympics uh, and then and well, and won a bronze medal at the Olympics, too. But um, so he was a good amateur. It wasn't like he was inexperienced, but it, apparently, as the story goes, one night in a Polish nightclub, uh, he was a little bit liquored up. So was this other dude. And Galata was with his team, the Polish boxing team. And some guy asked Galata, like, will you please move out of the way? And Galata was like, fuck off. And so the guy tried to fight him. And instead of fighting the guy, the Polish boxing team disrobed the guy and threw his clothes away in the dumpster and the guy wound up with like a black eye and that was it but like you know he didn't get like stomped or anything they just like i guess we're trying to humiliate him or something but whatever wound up happening this altercation wound up leading to charges for galata and he fled the country and he never looked back uh so he built his record up you know in the u.s and he became something of like, there's a couple of pockets of uh, Polish folks in the U S Chicago is probably the biggest one. Absolutely. Um, I think that the, I, I remember somebody saying like there were more, there were more Polish folks in and around Chicago than in like much, most bigger cities in Poland or something like that. I mean, I'd, I'd believe it because I know there are really big uh, pockets of that, but I know that in any case, <laughs> Andrew Galata married a, I think a Polish American lady and he stayed in the U.S., but I think that he felt very alienated because he never really wound up learning very good English, uh, and he still he still felt as if he was uh, an immigrant. And before he had even gotten into professional boxing, was looking to be like a truck driver and yes. all sorts of other stuff totally. because he just was not he he didn't feel like he fit in, and you know he was he he felt like an immigrant. And also, not to get into other shit. But very briefly, Polish immigrants have a history of being discriminated against, not just in the U.S., but currently in the U.K., there's a bad issue with that as well. So, um, yeah, I think that he he was eventually enticed. He was discovered by a dude, um, I can't remember what it was, like the airport or some shit like that. And the guy steered him toward a boxing gym and got him back into the boxing gym and he was making 50 bucks a round earlier in his career. And he was usually fighting for like one round. So he wasn't making shit. Totally. You know, and he started out, like you said, he, he ended up settling mostly in, in Chicago and early on with his career, he was fighting mostly trail horses and guys that would just get him experience. Um, by the time he ends up hooking up with um, main events. And I believe actually a uh, little known, little known fact about this. I think a lot of, um was one of the reasons why George Benton actually left main events. So what happened back then, I don't I don't I don't I don't remember the exact story. I hope Galata was worth it, bro. <laughs> and something like that. I think Benton was trying to I think that he felt like they were trying to like keep more fighters away from him and Galata being one of the key ones or something like that. And Benton was kind of like fuck this and you know just took off. But I know Galata was one of the key guys. I don't, and I know there's a story out there about it, but I know that there's that that was one of the reasons why Benton ended up leaving in the '90s, in the mid '90s, um, shortly after the uh, Whitaker Chavez fight. But um, yeah, you know, Galata at this point in the mid '90s, he was you know fighting in the same places that you would find mostly like at the Bismarck Hotel in Chicago, Rosemont, stuff like that. But he was also fighting in other places too, like smaller casinos that are no longer around in Vegas, like the Aladdin for instance, or, you know, going to Boardwalk Hall in Atlantic City and fighting at the bottom of an undercard. Regardless, he's staying busy. You know, like, he's fighting a ton of times in 93, signing a bunch in 94. And by the time in the 
near the end of 1994, um, he's starting to finally step up his competition a little bit. Like at this point, he's just guys gaining experience, trail horses of that matter. Um, one of the first names on his record that he ends up finding is a guy by the name of uh, Jeff Lampkin. Jeff Lampkin was, um, if you looked at his record, you're going to be like, yeah, you know, what about him? Yada, yada. But if you look more into it, Lampkin was one of those guys that as a light heavyweight and cruiserweight in the late seventies and all throughout the eighties was a dude who fought who's who of everybody. There wasn't a guy he didn't duck. And most of the times he didn't get stopped. Like he went the distance with everybody. Yeah. And right when you, Youngstown was big, he was a Youngstown guy and he was a big amateur. And he was a tough as nails guy too, man. He was a really talented fighter who everybody was pissed off at because he clearly didn't fight up to his ability after the time. He would always do enough just to lose. Yeah, I'm pretty and, sure he was like a national AAU champion or some some other national champion, you know. And he was a really good fighter. So by the, time, by the time the late '80s rolled uh, rolled came in, um, he started finally putting like shit together for him. It was like, you know what? I'm not just going to keep on losing decisions. And ended up winning a cruiserweight belt. So. At this point, this is a good win for Galata because Galata steamrolled him in one round. And um, from there, you know, same thing. He's still fighting kind of trail horses, yada, yada. But then his first fight then that you really, people caught him on national television and he made a lot of attention, um, somewhat infamously, was against a guy by the name of Sam Sepahua. And this took place in 1995. And you know what? It's funny too. It's somewhat ironic because this isn't even close to being the first instance where somebody got bitten in a boxing match. Close. It's been happening since the 1800s. <laughs> yeah, that. like even even farther back. Yeah. Because because in certain parts of England, the prize fighters were known as some funky word like biters or chompers or some shit like that because they were known to bite during fights. And in any case, uh, yeah, like Oscar Bonavena bit some dude in an amateur fight in the, in the Pan Am games. Even Evander Holyfield somewhat serendipitously ironically bit someone in the amateurs too before he got, got his fucking ear bitten by Mike Tyson. So anyway, you know, but um, yeah, it, there's a little bit of a history and, but this would be similar to kind of like Bo Tillery where we first saw an introduction to Riddick Bo as like somebody who just courts disaster and controversy. Similarly, we got to see a glimpse of Andrew Galata the absolutely unhinged fighter who's super talented, but completely unable to deal with adversity. Doesn't know what to do when a fighter is pushing him back or doesn't know what to do when he's not, he's a total front runner. You know, when he's yeah. not front running, he panics. And so, you know, and that's, that's the kind of like kind of bully behavior that we would see from Galata throughout his career for the most part. Totally. And in this fight, he was getting, you know, a lot of resistance. But Hua was one of those guys that was like, really, if you saw him, very flabby, out of shape. But he was a good amateur himself. Had, you know, had good, like a good skilled fighter. Um, clearly, he was levels below the elite, but he was, you know, for the time period. Better than you thought, but not like that good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, he at one point, he was humming on. He was humming Galata. He was getting in his ass. You know what I mean? Galata was a little hurt there. He got him with a few combinations. Galata had a you know fight back out of that and then you know he was having some rough patches and then they get caught in a clinch and you see galata like it's not just like a little subtle kind of like nip or something like that this dude goes full-on chomping like you know on the shoulder and all these years later what two um we're almost 28 years after this fight took place and it's incredible to me to think that he didn't get disqualified like, did the referee miss? I haven't watched it in a long time. The referee missed it or whatever. Even if he didn't, you could see the bite marks immediately after that. If he went to the corner, you could see, like, it was a nasty bite. And Pahua visibly screamed. You see him lean back and yell out and yelp because that shit, like, he just got chomped. And Pahua never really recovered from that. I mean, who could? You know what I mean? It, yeah, and, it's it like, it, like, startled him. Like, he was, like, yeah. not expecting that at all. And I think that shit shook him. Like, he was like, whoa, holy shit. <laughs> Lily is shook him. Anyone who gets fucking chomped on the shoulder like that, like a vampire would get shook. You know what I mean? That's so, like you're in a street fight and somebody like does like grabs your fucking balls or some shit. You're like, oh, you're obviously willing to do anything to win. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, man. So yeah, but who was stopped soon after that? And then um uh I think his tra uh, Galata's trainer at this point, one of his trainers was um Chicago veteran. Was it Sam Col Sam Colonna? Corona, one of those guys? Sam yeah, uh 
alone. All right. Oh damn! Now you got me. Now you got me questioning it. Yeah, I guess yes, Kelowna. Yeah. Kelowna. Yeah. Wait a second. Yeah. Because on the Legendary Knights episode, he mentioned this. He goes, they were like, oh yeah, he bites him, and then afterwards they're like, Andrew, did you bite him? And Andrew Glutter in that really thick accent <laughs> apparently said. I had to bite the motherfucker. Like something yeah. out of a movie. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the classic moments. So like that legendary night. Scene. I had yeah. to bite the motherfucker. Yeah, I had to great. bite the motherfucker. Like, no. You know, so. You really didn't, bro. You really didn't. You should have punched him. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So Galata's, Galata's yeah. first, um, first time in the big time where he's really like uh, showcased, um, you know, across the country and across the world for that matter. Uh, was uh, was on a show for HBO when they had that one time in the 90s was uh, Night of the Young Heavyweights. And that one featured David to uh, obliterating um, John Ruiz in you know, 15 seconds or whatever it was. And then you had Shannon Briggs getting knocked out in a big upset against um, Daryl Wilson. And then, to Gladys' credit, think about this. What guys like Tua who was looked upon as like the new Mike Tyson, Shannon Briggs, who had a ton, a ton of um of you know hype around him uh galato was featured as the main event of that fight and he fought a guy by the name of Don, uh Danell nichols oh man <laughs> oh, one of the yo oh, man talking about like the poa uh bite and blatant fouls yeah like, the dude was just man so brutal stylistically galata would also do this thing where he just put the earmuffs up and kind of just lean in you know like he'd get a little st too stationary and you could hit him like you could tee off on his ass and you'd have to be careful of the the counters because he's he was a boxer puncher definitely leaned more toward boxer but could punch and mm -hmm. but he would just kind of freeze up sometimes and against Donnell Nicholson, so like you said, you know, Tua knocks out Ruiz, which is just one of the more brutal knockouts you're ever going to fucking see, dude. Like that last punch, to, uh, Ruiz is like falling in midair and gets like yeah. that hook, like in midair. Yes, like, I just Jesus swiveled. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So brutal. But so um, uh, Andrew Golata, you know, going, uh, Donnell Nicholson's not a, not a bad fighter, but this is obviously he's only had one loss in this fight. And so this is kind of earlier in his career before he had really become a little bit more of a on the edge of a, a, a journeyman ish kind of fighter, not quite journeyman, but, you know, almost leaning toward that area. And so but still, this is before then. And uh, he's still considered a for formidable fighter. And Galata's struggling. Galata struggles a lot with anybody who's putting up resistance, pretty much. That's what it comes down to. If he's not able to kind of like hurt you or do something like where you're showing that you're going to fold or something like that. Yeah. He headbutts the fuck out of you. He headbutts the absolute shit out of you, bro. I mean, and this damn, wasn't even like... one of those fights that like Galata yeah. wasn't out of control in, you oh, know, Nicholson man. was a very passive individual. He was a good boxer. He was a former Olympian himself. He came from the 92 class. And at this point, it was already known that Nicholson was already a level below because he got blown yeah. out by Jeremy Williams the first time it's he stepped like up. It's not like Galata's getting beat up or anything. It's just well, he's he just was, not he kicking was, his ass. Exactly. He was clearly winning the fight, and he was in control of it, but it wasn't a very exciting fight either. Galata was just you know going through the motions, and Nicholson was just doing enough to lose. Yeah, he's like he frustrating him. Enough, yeah, but he was showing enough resistance that Galata got frustrated with it. And at one point, say, I forgot what round it was, but like they're in the they're in a clinch. And again, Galad is in control of the fight. He's winning it. And he decides they're in a clutch. He, boom! And he headbutts the shit out of him, like, really hard. And Nicholson, you just, you know, it's, it's a nasty headbutt. And you're kind of wondering, why? Why did you, like, you know, there should have been all these red flags already first with the bite and now this, that this dude is clearly unstable when anyone decides to punch back on him. Got, you know, the nerve of this person. But at this point, man, you know, it was like, that was that was a serious question. And... You know, the other thing that you can mention about that fight before we move on to the bow fight now is that, like, that was the first time uh, the public got to see Emmanuel Stewart had a public had a freak out the way he did. You know, everyone remembers him with Jermaine Taylor or Klitschko or, you know, um, most famously, like, Len Lennox Lewis probably, right? But in this fight, it was either, I think it was after the headbutt round, Stewart just got lost it. Like, he was oh, so... Yeah. He, he tripped out. 
he get in there, he called him a bitch, right? He said, you acted like a little bitch in there. He told him, I was like, I don't care if you get knocked out, go in there and fucking fight this guy. He's so basic, it's pathetic. And, you know, and it starts yelling, yelling, yelling. At the end of it, he goes in, fight this motherfucker. And then you hear, um, you hear uh, um, Larry Merchant. I have never heard Emmanuel get this angry in a corner before. He wants this man to go to war. <laughs> Bro, it was it was some straight up like Braveheart fucking like speech, like motivational speech. This motherfucker, yeah, dude. Even even had Donnell Nicholson, who who a moment like coming the corner is looking like downtrodden and like not looking so good, and Emmanuel Stewart starts yelling at him, and he's like, yeah, 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 damn it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like he's starting to get him pumped, and he's just like. Fuck it. I'm fuck it. I'm gonna do it. <laughs> well, he it's has good, it, yeah, man. man. Like Stuart was just like he was like fighting dog him. By the man, this guy's so pathetic. He's like, fight that like just get him. Like you can just see the one of those things about Emmanuel Stewart when he sees that the opponent that his guy is fighting is clearly not shit and his guy is not doing anything. He gets very he would used to, you know, God bless him. He used to get very annoyed by that and let you know, you know, this guy ain't nothing. Well, how are you gonna let him still hang around here? Do something, take him out. <laughs> Yeah, like we we talked about that shit the other night, dude. Like when he did it to Jermaine Taylor, he was like sad. He was like, "Come on, you gotta just fight him. Like, go fight him." But when I he did it to Don Nicholson, he's like, <laughs> "You motherfucker, you get the fuck out." He was he was pissed. This one, he was just over it. He was like, "Man, you got twelve rounds. He was like, "You got one more round. You got to fight." Like, fuck it. <laughs> like, yeah. At that point, he was just like, "I don't even what." <laughs> Running from Corey Spinks, the fuck are you doing? Yeah, exactly. You bastard. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, uh, so Andrew Galata obviously showing his true colors here, but but uh, <laughs> Donnell Nicholson briefly, briefly comes back and is able to kind of push Galata back, and it's like looking for a second, almost like you know, like Galata's going to fold, but then he just he issues for like the last two or three rounds, like a beat down, just absolutely starts beating the shit out of Don- Donnell Nicholson and makes it, you know, he, they got to stop it in the corner. You know, he had he was not the kind of fighter that was going to come back from that. You know, he's not that kind of fighter. He doesn't hit like that, doesn't really fight like that. Too passive, like you said. And after it was, what, seven or eight rounds or whatever, it was just, yeah, yeah. it was too much. And uh, But that positioned Galata to get this shot at Riddick Bo. And again, not a lot of people knew who, who Galata was. Uh, but Bo was positioned as a 10-to-1 favorite going into this fight. I mean, like... That's that's pretty fucking wide, especially when you look at their records and stuff like that. I mean, I know it's on paper, so you can't trust, you know, you can't just say, oh, the guy is 26 and 0 or 28 and 0 or whatever it was. Like, that doesn't necessarily say everything, but it's not like they were all bums. It's not like, you know, you had experience. So it's pretty wild that they made that 10 to 1. Absolutely, man. And, you know, there was. It, it was just an afterthought. Like everyone thought, okay, Bo's just it was like an easy summer fight that they were gonna make, and it's a homecoming for Bo too because it was be- taking place at MSG, and then from there he was gonna go on you know, Hot, in July, Madison yeah. Square Garden in New York. Um, I watched this live with my dad. You know, it was one of those nights that we were excited to watch like a live fight, and I gotta let me just double check. I'm pretty sure I think it happened on a random day too. Like it wasn't like a normal night that uh that it took place. It wasn't like a Thursday or some well, shit. Thursday, yeah, Thursday. Yeah, it was like some weird ass day. Yeah, which was really odd for back then because especially I mean like well we got Thursday night fights and you have other times they'll have a Thursday card here and there or whatever. But yeah, but never like a big HBO. fight. You know, never not usually. HBO. I think that might be the only time I can think of off the top of my head. Unless they did that early in their early, early, early days, they might have like a random day they'd have a show. But like, um, yeah, in terms of like their heyday in the nineties, I think that's the only time they like aired a Thursday card. Yeah, it. I don't know what how to account for the whole weird day, but yeah, I mean, it was set up uh, main events, like you said, ma- main events. We haven't really mentioned them a whole lot, but their involvement with uh andrew galata you know roger bloodworth was one of the trainers that worked with them and lou duva um you know was also training andrew galata and they had taken you know taken control of his career and they were also very familiar dealing with rock newman and riddick bow because they had handled evander holyfield you know pretty much throughout uh his his involvement with main events and in you know his fights with uh riddick bow too so they knew they were well aware of of you know what they were dealing with and everything like that but at the same time um 
you know, they, it's just nobody, I guess, was really prepared for something like this. I guess nobody was really prepared to, and, and also it's not like there haven't been incidents before that were sparked by bad decisions or whatever. One of the more famous ones was in LA uh, after Lionel Rose defended the bantamweight title against Chucho Castillo and fucking chaos erupted. So it's not like boxing is totally ignorant to how things like this can happen, but it really did seem like a powder keg and the perfect storm. Um, You know, the legendary Knights kind of tried to paint it as a racial thing. I don't really know if that's really true per se. Maybe it really was on the ground. I don't know. I, I wasn't there, but um, you know, they, the way they kind of tried to paint it was like, there's these factions of Polish, they got the flags and they're chanting, they're like soccer fans and the hooligans. And then there's the black fans who are for both. Like, that's kind of how they painted it. Seems kind of extreme for me. I think it just was people who were drinking and at a fucking event going nuts. But well, in any yeah. case, very passionate fans on both ends of the spectrum. Like I've been, I'll, I'll say this, I've been uh, live for a few automatic fights back when he was like really popping in New Jersey and those fans would turn out like absolutely turn out. They're you know enthusiastic, I mean? bro. They're definitely and enthusiastic. I was for sure. with one because I had the nerve to cheer for uh, Jason Estrada, who I knew personally of Cape Verde and whatever in front of me. And this drunk dude tried picking a fight with me and I almost dropped his ass. So like, you know, people can get rowdy, but at the same time, that's just people in general in sports. You know what I mean? And then you always get ignorant yeah, I mean, assholes at both these events and just. Yeah, wanna... I'm not inclined to believe it was like along racial lines like that. That sounds. A no, little no, it was just that you got but... very passionate fans on both ends, and just a lot of um, a lot of just you know things going on with it, and then the fight happens too, where going along with it and like what was supposed to be an after like an afterthought, Goliath is kicking his ass instead. You know. Yeah, dude, you know, and I talked about Rick Bo's weight. We talked about his discipline issues. And he goes from, you know, that first uh, Evander Holyfield fight. He weighs in at 235, which is like ideal weight for him. You know, 230, 235. He's six, what, six four, six five. So, excuse me, like there's only, if you have any sort of muscle on you at that height, there's only so low that your weight is going to even be able to go period, like physically, you know what I mean? Without you cutting something off. And so 235, six foot four, six foot five, that's a really good sized heavyweight. And it seemed like an ideal weight for him. The problem was he was blowing up to like 290, 300 pounds and shit like that. And it wasn't like a 290 where he was like still training, but he was just loafing 290. And so he comes back down for this Galata fight. And like, we're talking about where he's have, like we were talking about earlier, where he's saying he doesn't know how to train for this guy. Nobody knows him. He's a bum. How do I train for a bum? I think is the thing he said. Uh, and so he comes in and it's like two fifty something and it's noted. Cause you could see it. He's, he's a very visible two fifty something. And they're both carried about- weight, both carried weight, man. Whenever that dude was big, he was fleshy. Absolutely. Yes, he yeah he he did not hide it super great and then on top of that i don't know if it was like a poorly fitted like like protector but like every so often you see a fighter and it's like the protector is just like it just does not go into their fucking trunks and yeah, the yeah. same thing is and i don't know if it was because he was fat maybe but it was like not fitting correctly too so he just looked a mess dude he looked a fucking mess and then on top of that you know apart from just how he visibly looked the fight starts and it's just he looks so washed like amazingly washed like who is this guy and it's like you're wondering watching that you're like is galata really this good or is bo like this washed and yeah. you're not even sure what you're watching here because it, it, it was like it's, it's people were like stunned they were like what because Galata at this point, like we said, he's been featured on television, but he's never put it together the way he's putting it right now. Like, no one had seen this. Like, this dude was, when you say, like, the modern heavyweight, the way you want to see him fight and the, the way he was moving and boxing and everything, like, he was looking incredible. People were just like, who the fuck is this? You know, he was jabbing. He was moving. Like, the combinations were flowing. And he wasn't missing anything. Bo was hard. Wasn't hard. Was, yeah, he looked like Bo against Holyfield the first time. <laughs> and 
He uses there. Bop, bop, bop. Throws a combination to the body before he starts going low. Boom, boom. Comes up to the top. Bop. Hit him with uppercut. Looks like he's out. He's um he's out fighting Bo on the inside. He's out boxing him on the outside. He's faster than Bo. Bo is just even more slower and cumbersome than usual because he's carrying all that additional weight and he's just kind of plodding around. And Glad is piecing him up. Like it's you know it, it's it's incredible to watch. You're just like wow, man. This is really this is wild. Because you're not sure where to look at this. Is Bo that washed or is Galano this good? Or is it a combination of the two? And while you're being fascinated with that, though, all of a sudden, little things start happening. I Like, you know, after the first couple of rounds, yep, they're getting in there, boom! Like, Galano will, like, throw a combination and finish it with a hook to the body. But instead of it being a hook to the body, it'd be a low blow. It would just be, like, a tapping one, like, doop, doop, doop. And, like, he hit him, you know. And Bo would usually grab his nuts and go down or something would happen. And you're just kind of like, oh, shit, all right, well, there's one. And then you think, okay, well, he was just in the middle of a combination. He just kind of let one loose. Like, it happens. Okay. And then it started happening again and again and again. And you're kind of wondering, wait, 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 what? what? What's what's going on here? And it started, and the fight started taking a weird turn where you knew that something bad was going to happen or something weird was going to happen sooner or later. But... You weren't sure if Bo was going to get knocked out before something weird was going to happen. Like, it was a weird teetering line there. You know what I mean? It, it was just so, it was so weird because it turned from, like, and I think they said something similar in the Legendary Knights, too, but it turned from, like, being stunned that Galato was winning the way that he was winning and with such ease to, like, being stunned that, like, is this guy going to fuck this up? Exactly. Like you, you're starting to, like, watch it and you're just like, what what's happening here? What's this fucking guy doing? And, you know, because like you said, it would be just like he'd throw some fucking beautiful combination, but then there would be like a pause right at the end, and he'd be like, "Bap!" Like, and it was like, "Whoa, that was a really hard shot to the balls." You know, fucking guy, man. And I mean, it was it. Looking back now, it seems like he was probably doing it intentionally, but it was like at the time my God, you know, how just stunning uh, this was turning out. I mean, they were flabbergasted in Galata's corner. Like, they're, you know, because Galata's winning this fight. It's not close. He can't even really look and see what round that Bo clearly could have got the better of. Like, he, I don't say, I'm not going to say that Bo was just getting completely ramrodded and lost every, you know, every second of the fight. He was landing a few punches there, too. Probably contributing to Galata wanting to throw low blows because Bo was showing some resistance. You know what I mean? Even though he was losing the majority of the fight and getting whooped around, he had the nerve to still stand up and show that he could take it and still, you know, throw punches back here and there because Bo had won the biggest hearts in the division's history. And Galata, again, it's that mental thing that we talked about, like, you know, with a bully. As much, even if he's dominant and in control, as long as you start showing some kind of resistance to him, he's going to start reverting to doing some bullshit. And... You know, Galata's corner was like flabbergasted. You had Lou Duva, you had um, Roger Bloodworth at this point, who I think took over the spot of um, uh, what should we call it? Um, George Benson, George Benton for that, or you know, for Galata's corner at least, and probably Sam Colonna in that corner. And they're all screaming in unison, like, "Stop going to the fucking body now! Like, what are you doing? You know, you're winning this fight, you're winning it easily, but now you keep on getting points taken away, and you're making a fight that you're winning going away, and you're making it close because you keep on getting points deducted, and you're about to get disqualified." Like, stop it. Like, they're pleading with him in the corner. Stop going to the body. And the latter is, like, nodding along. But at the same time, you clearly see that, like, he's almost just, you know, in his own world still, right? He's and then he's got a thousand-yard stare, dude. Yeah. You and so... Lou Duva over there in the corner looking like if Danny DeVito just got really angry and old. <laughs> so you have all this going on. And... You just feel like this ticking time pop, this ticking time bomb is about to go off now because you're watching this and you're going, okay, is he going to get disqualified? Is Bo going to get knocked out? Like something is going to happen here. No way this fight is going the distance. And in the, uh, the last round before Galata gets disqualified, they beg him again. They're like, Andrew, do not go to the body. Don't do anything. Like, what well, are you going to do that? And Andrew goes, okay, okay, I won't go to the body. What does he do when he walks out there? Ding, ding, round seven, walks out there. Gets Bo with a vicious combination, low, a low blow combination. And it, Pat, it wasn't even one that like he started to the head or nothing. He literally walked in there and threw two hooks, a right hook and a left hook. Boop, boop. And both of them went to the fucking cup. And Bo grabbed his shit, as any of us would, and dropped in agony in a heap. But he lays there and he's, and he's crying. And hold on one second, because I actually want to get the magazine for it. Um, <laughs> 
it's it's so fucking wild, bro. And it's not even like this came out of nowhere, like you said. Like it had been building. He got he got warnings in like three separate rounds, and then got a point taken in like round four or five because it was like he would not stop. And then there's poor. Well, oh, there's the just, cover. That's what Bo looked like right there at the end of the just fight, holding his bowels. Poor yeah. guy. And. <laughs> You know, you're watching this on television live. Everybody in the arena who wasn't really pissed off, we're about to get in that to one second, is everyone's just stunned. Everyone's just like, what the fuck did we just watch? And it almost encompassed boxing at that point and just like the 90s in general where you're just like, okay, you know, <laughs> we had a guy that literally had this fight won, the biggest fight of his career. He had it in the palm of his hand and he just, and he just dropped the ball for no reason. Like, um, and... As you're trying to process all that happening, everything happens so fast immediately after this. Like moments after Bo gets dropped and gets, you know, is laying there and Wayne Kelly stops the fight. Um, within a few seconds, you see Rock Newman come charging into the ring. And we talked about it before. Newman was a very passionate guy. He was always very protective of Bo, as is Bo's uh, posse. And the first thing you see when Newman walks in there, he goes stomping across the ring halfway over and he goes like this. He just points. <laughs> Get him. Get him, exactly. Sick him. <laughs> the first thing you see is one of Riddick Bo's boy, homies come from behind, and he tries swinging. Galata turns around and actually clocks this guy with the right hand, knocks his hat off, and the guy goes flying back. But as he does that, one of uh, Riddick Bo's other henchmen, or one of his uh, bodyguards, that is, a guy by the name of uh, Jason Harris, I believe his name was, and he was one of Bo's heads, heads of security. Um, he comes from the side with an old school cell phone. And if you're, you know, growing up in the early 90s and everything like that, if you grew, if you're, if you were living in the 90s, you know exactly what we're talking about. This is like, a weapon. Giant walkie-talkies that were at least 10 to 15, 10 pounds or so. Like, them things were like cinder blocks. You know what I mean? Heavy. Just... Yeah, the quote-unquote Zach Morris phone. But it was yeah. like Zach Morris would pull this shit out of his pocket and you would be like, you're a fucking liar. That shit did not fit in your fucking pocket, you liar. Exactly. And he took this thing and the first thing you see is that he walks over to Galata, ouch, slams it on the back of his head as hard as he can. And then he slams it again so hard that the shit probably breaks. Like you just see it just kind of go. And Galata at that point grabs himself because now he has a jagged cut on the back of his head after getting just slammed in the head twice with uh, with that cell phone. And all hell broke. All it's hell breaks. literal chaos from there. Out of nowhere, just complete chaos. Bo's posse comes into the ring and just starts going wild. And at that point, Galata's corner is trying to fend for themselves. And people ringside are trying to go crazy. Like, it, it's just, you know, it was a powder keg. Yeah, Everything Lou Duva is out. flattened. Fucking within moments, within moments, Jim Lampley and everyone, all of them were trying to comprehend what the fuck is happening in front of them. And they're trying, you know, it, it's crazy. Like it's just happened so suddenly. And the first time you hear real Lampley get really like exasperated is you hear him go, Look, Duva's down, Lou Duva's down right there. And it's crazy. You see it right there. All of a sudden, all this chaos, people are fighting. There's Lou Duva laying there unconscious on the floor. And it, and it's 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 by now, if you've been on the internet long enough. Yeah. You've seen some sort of fight video where there's so much going on that you just can't, you can't even focus. Like there's just a sea of fighting and that's what yeah. it is. Then the whole ring is people fighting and cops trying to get a handle on it. But then it's, it spills out because, he, because of course it does. Cause it can't, you know, it's because the insanity is infectious. That shit is not, you know, and then you put people in a group and they start acting like it's a fucking riot. And so that's, so people just started fighting everywhere. Like they're yeah. fighting next to the ring. They're fighting in the first couple rows. They're fighting in the stands, throwing shit, throwing chairs, throwing their drinks, like throwing shit into the ring. Uh, you know, and then of course, if you've ever been to a live fight in like a large venue, uh, like a large arena, they have the little production booths or like the production like nests, like crow nest looking things where the entire crews like they're uh, away from where the, the fights are taking place and shit like that. So then, you know, they they pan back out and you could see Lampley and everybody else is up away from the fighting. So they're not in the midst of it where in other places they might be because they might be on the ground, you know, doing this shit. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it just devolved so fucking quickly. 
the, probably the craziest thing to me looking back, I mean, apart from all of the craziness that was happening, is the fact that they stuck with it. Like yeah. they kept filming it and they kept talking and they're like looking around They're Okay. There's this fucking group of guys getting their shit kicked in over here. Oh, they're, look at this guy over fucking rolling yeah. around. This is, they just this stuck is with it and just were like looking around, watching the fights. That would not happen now. <laughs> and think about this too, is that the, the security wasn't shit that night for whatever reason, everyone even said before the fight, that the, those reporters are the ones that said that they were an MSG, that they noticed there was like heightened tension by the crowd and they felt, and they felt a certain way. But then I think Kriegel was one of the people there that night. Mark Kriegel, you know, most known on ESPN now. Um, people forget. Was he, was he there a, writing about somebody's dad? Probably, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but people forget he was actually featured on the legendary nights that way That's back true, when. Yeah. He's, been, he's been around a long time. And, um, he said he was there now, and he mentioned that like one of the things there was that the lack of security. A lot of people noticed that when you went in, you were just kind of like, oh, "Where's the police? Where's anybody?" And how they found out about it, the chief of I think the, the head of security, chief of police, found out about the riot happening because he was watching television, and he just happened to click over. It was like riot at the garden. He was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> like you're not going to stop groups of people from fighting, especially all over the arena if you only have a handful of cops around. That not going to you know what I mean? That wasn't going to stop anything, and as it went crazy in the ring, they would like calm down for a brief second. And then you would hear them say that things seems, you know, things seem to be like relaxing a little bit at this moment. All of a sudden, someone would get on the apron and jaw jack or say something. And all of a sudden, some dude would come over pop, and hit him with a sucker punch. Guy would go fly and then a whole other fucking riot would start right there again. And before, you know, to bring up another thing, before you like, you said that like you saw Lampley way in the, in the stands, you know, broadcasting from there and stuff like that. They were still on the floor originally when all that broke out. You know what I mean? People were going wild and everything. And I've heard from more than one person who was a part of that team that night and who worked ringside that George Foreman saved them all. <laughs> and that was the reason why no one from yeah. HBO got hurt or touched is because George Foreman single-handedly made sure no one got around them. <laughs> well, and that was the don't do it, son. Yes, fight. exactly. Because, because <laughs> like, well, yeah. So they were originally on the floor calling the fight, obviously. But in a smaller venue, they might not have been able to, like, get away. And luckily they did. And they were able to get away from where the fighting was. Or I don't know if they went through the tunnel or what. But you could, But when shit was falling apart and all hell was breaking loose, you can hear uh, Big George at one point, don't do it, son. Because yeah. somebody had come up and was obviously going to do some shit or grab a chair yeah. or something. You know what I mean? And he was like... You know, if you're in the and you're in the midst of a fight, unless you're like, you know, crazy because you got punched in the face and now you're not thinking you run up and you see George Foreman, even like 50 year old George Foreman. You're going to fucking stop. <laughs> you're going to stop doing what you're doing. And so luckily that that sounds like that's what happened. Yeah, because I've I've heard that, uh, you know, I think they might have even said that on the legendary nights where they're like George Foreman saved our lives that night or something like that. Because they said George just stood up and he had his arms crossed and he was like, Don't do that. And people were just like, Okay, because what are you gonna do? You gotta test George Foreman? <laughs> it's like, I saw what you did to Michael Moore, sir. We're good. Even that, bro, like he would just take your head and turn it into dust immediately. Like, stop. Yeah, you're not a fighter, you're just a regular human being. He'll kill you. Even George, well, George has turned 74. You still want to test him? No, <laughs> Fuck no, dude. Are you kidding me? I'm not dumb. I've seen all you bit, man. We know what happens. So, how many ex fighters have somebody tried to rob on the street and then just you get you fucking okay. shit kicked out of you? Jack, Jack Dempsey did it like nine different times. Jack Dempsey yeah, was like, he was, oh, living, he was living in New York during a very wild period, walking around in mink coats. You know what yeah, I mean? motherfuckers were just coming up and trying to rob Jack Dempsey and get knocked out like every other month, dude. Are you kidding me? Stay away from Jack Dempsey. Yeah. Right. It, it, was it. Did, it was wild, dude. Uh, the way that everything unfolded. And and I mean, it was pretty fucking violent. There was a lot of fights going on, a lot of shit getting thrown about. It was incredible. It and, was absolutely incredible to see that. And, you know, Lamp, Lampley, again, another thing he mentioned, too, is that he was worried because his daughter was in the audience. He said, I have a 16-year-old daughter out there, and I hope that she's okay. Yep. Yep. And, and, uh, not to like get weird, but she's disabled as well because his ex-wife, Bree Walker, you know, had a, I can't remember what the condition is called, but she had the hand condition and both of their children, if I'm not mistaken also. So, I mean, like I, 
that just adds an extra element of, I'm sure me being a father, just being like, holy fuck. Like, yeah. you know, like they can't even protect themselves like that. So what the fuck? So yeah, I remember that's like one of the final moments of that broadcast is Lampley says, you know, me, I have a daughter out there somewhere that I got to go find. And then they like sign off and it's like, Jesus Christ. And then, and then, and then they like, cause you know, Lamp still has to give all the production notes and all that other stuff. So they mentioned, you know, you know, credits to this one, producer, yada, yada, yada. And then at the end of it, I think Clamp Lee tries to sum it up. He was like, what's wrong with us, America? What are we doing? And all of it is like clips of people getting arrested now because they were showing just live shots. And you just see the chaos afterwards and dudes being dragged out, kicking and screaming, blood everywhere, all that. Like, There's like puddles of blood here injured. and there. And... A lot of people got injured that night, man. A lot of people got injured. It was... If you watch closely, you see dudes, like you said, everyone just started fighting. It just became, you know, it was infectious. Everyone started fighting. And you see guys in one separate fight that a person come out, probably didn't even know who the hell those guys were, run over, bow, sucker punched the shit out of a dude. Guy goes flying across, like, just, oh, man. It's a wild broadcast, bro. And I'm sure a homie, Jay Seclo or somebody's got, got it up. And oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have a sneaking suspicion he's be he's watching the show because this fool's been putting up some shit after we say something too. So Jay, put it up if you don't already. No, nah, it's a it's a crazy broadcast, dude. It's um it's a definitely like like you said, talking about Jerry Springer and Moy Povich, Richard Bay, all that crazy fucking daytime talk show kind of shit where it's like bordering on reality TV but intensity and really trying to capture as much chaos as possible. Perfect. Absolutely yeah. perfect. You know, uh, and just going over it, it wound up the, the following couple days, you know, the black eye for boxing and it, it didn't go over so well, dude, you know, it, oh, it was well, I mean, it, it just like, that was the thing. Cause everybody is like the, the average fan was always just sus- uh, like sus- was always suspicious about boxing. You know, always carried it. If you weren't a real fan of the sport, oh, boxing is this and that. Look at the people involved. Blah, blah, blah. That gives them more fuel to the fire. Oh, like, oh, look at what happened last night with that fight. You see that riot that took place that just lasted for like a half an hour? Oh, typical sports. Blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, but in boxing too, you take something like that and then you think money. You know what I mean? That's how exactly. most of the motors <laughs> That's yeah. That's the crazy <laughs> dichotomy is how fucked up it makes you look and how <laughs> stupid and how like people are just like see i knew it always it's always but then the promoters are like yeah yeah because they just think okay they got a new star in their hands and galata even though he like gave the fight away he can clearly fight and he's white i hate to say it but i mean totally turned it into promotional material too totally absolutely and then you got Bo, who underestimated him and never took an ass kick like that in his career, and then got humiliated at the Garden, is left there, you know, holding his nuts, and that was the final image of him before the riot started. Like, now he's motivated because he wants to come back and do this stuff. Like, there was, you know, there was so many layers to it. And then, of course, that was the added intrigue, is that is Galata going to snap again? That's what everyone really wanted to see, you know? And Exactly. It turned into that Mike Tyson, like, when is he going to go nuts type of shit. So, like, in, in the... And the subsequent time after that fight took place, because um, you had it in, in the five months after that fight took place, there was a lot of stuff going on. Was Galata going to get, uh, you know, fine? Was this going to happen? All the stuff. People, even people on Galata's side were trying to prove that this was all bullshit and that Bo was faking it. For instance, excuse me, I got a fucking cold over here. Um, Howie Albert. Now, if you remember how he, if you know, if you're familiar with that name, that was Emil Griffith's manager and, um, you know, a fight guy from the 60s all the way until the 90s, whatever. Not sure what he had to do involved with main events at this point, but he put on a demonstration where he was swinging a baseball bat at a poor intern's nuts while the guy had a cup on to prove that Bo was faking it. As you can... <laughs> giving him the fucking Tony Gwynn treatment right on his fucking nuts. And I'm not sure what that's supposed to prove or why that intern was told. It's like a still photo. So for all you know, he's just holding the bat. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. I have no idea. But I mean, I I hope that's what was happening, you know? 
But I'm just wondering myself, I was like, when that dude signed up for an internship with main events back in the day, probably do some PR work or whatever it was, they ever thought that he thought one day he was going to be used in a demonstration to get a baseball bat swung at his... I hope know, he's got it on his LinkedIn now. Seriously. <laughs> Hitting the dick by... Yeah. Jesus. By how you are. <laughs> Thanks, Galata. That's a great and, um, bullet point. So there, so there we were, man. There was just a lot, a lot, a lot going on with that. And people were excited. I was excited. Everybody was excited. You know, there was those publicity photos and videos of um, when they were talking about Galata. And they were like, oh, you know, we're trading him now like Duva. Duva and uh, Sam Colon and the rest of them were like, oh, yeah, as you see, we have a heavy bag. And we put a pair of pumps <laughs> on it. And we're telling Galata, nothing below here, Andrew. <laughs> They have like signs on it, and they've got trunks around the fucking. They've put exactly. trunks on the heavy bag, the heavy and they're bag. like, "Here, good. Here, no." Yeah, absolutely incredible. So, you know, as we move on to the rematch, that's that's the thing. Bolt comes in a tremendous shape, or at least he looks like he is. You know, what I mean, he looks really motivated. He's pissed off. Um, Eddie Futcher by this point is long gone after the sec after the first fight and the fiasco. That um, happened after it. Yeah, clearly he had no time for that shit. Yeah, so. he got pissed because Bo, uh, even though he got into better shape, was still exhibiting some of the same behavior. Like, was still, you know, he got he trained more, obviously, but he was still difficult to motivate. I think it sounded like from Eddie Futch's perspective. Totally, and you know, Futch is in his eighties. Do you think he really wants to be dealing with riots and all this he other said crazy? He was wasting his time. Yeah. He was like, I'm wasting my time doing this. And it's, yeah, dude, it's like, he's old. He did. He died not long after that. Exactly. Yeah. man. no one wants to go through that type of stuff. That's crazy. I wouldn't want to go through that. I'm decades younger than Futch was at that point. So it's like our cell after the fucking, you know, the no moss, he was like, fuck this dude. You know, this yeah. I'm old. <laughs> like I don't got time for this shit. Exactly. Yeah. So, so everyone, you know, the, the rematch happens, and even though Bo is in shape and he's fighting better than he did the first fight, Galata's still whooping his ass. <laughs> yeah, it. In my opinion, Bo definitely still looked washed, but not as washed as the first fight, and that yeah. was probably because he was just in better shape. You know, like he was able to. He was a little bit quicker. He definitely was not as sluggish, but he, you could tell that he was it, it, like the typical when a fighter gets shot washed whatever uh they just can't pull the trigger they see the openings but can't can't do it can't get it in time can't move or you know and the, and the problem with Bo was that he was he became more stationary he became yeah. more and more stationary as a fighter and even though Andrew Galata wasn't like you know he was not Ray Robinson or anything like that but he knew what to do with the stationary fighter and he had a very good jab yeah and you know, it was like, it was just one of those things that you're watching it, and Bo is taking tremendous punishment again. He's not moving out of the way for a lot of stuff. Galata's is hitting him everywhere and all that. But, you know, Bo does fight back. Like, he, Galata gets caught in the fight, and he also gets dropped for the first time in his career. I think it was. You know, Bo rallied, and he hurt Galata with the right hand, and then he landed a bunch of, you know, subsequent ones after that. And Galata went down um, pretty hard, in fact. But in between those moments... Galato was still whooping his ass. He was just, you know, beating on him. And it was sad to see because it reminded you, you know, there's a lot of all-time great fighters and great fighters that can still get in shape. But when you're washed, you're washed. You know what I mean? Like, you can, like, Ali when he fought Larry Holmes or people like that. And I don't, you know, Bo wasn't that bad to that degree what Ali was, but he was clearly past it, you know, and taking a lot of punishment and everything. And um, But then again, you know, it, it was fascinating because early See on the creep fight, in. You're just sitting there going, wait, wait. And then it starts. Galata starts throwing a combination, boom, gets hit with a low blow. And people are just like, what, 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 what? Really? <laughs> and you see the blood pressure of Galata's corner raising, and everybody's just like, Oh my god, not again, not again. Soon enough, boom, again, and again, and again, and again. And you just going, Oh my fucking god, this is happening again. I cannot believe this. Well, and right before the low blow started, too, uh, after after Bo got knocked down, you see Galata in a clinch start trying to headbutt him. And yeah. it's like you're sitting here going, You're like, Yeah, yeah. Wait, did okay, all right, all right, go okay, all right, keep fighting, keep fighting. But then he he keeps doing shit, and you're just like it's it dude it's like it makes you like gasp because you're watching and it's like and the funny thing was even though Bo was yeah like he's starting to get whooped 
but he was fighting back and it's starting to kind of turn into a good fight. But then as it's turning into a kind of a good fight, or at least a better fight than the first fight, Galata's starting to do shit like little things. And you're like, you're like, bro, really? We're doing this again. Buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just like a Jerry Springer show, bro. You you're getting what you're tuning in for. And that's what they were hoping for. You know what I mean? Like the tra- obviously Galata's trainers and main events were not hoping for this, but like Galata started unraveling again. Like you said, he dropped Bo. He's beating the crap out of him, but Bo is showing resistance. Bo is still fighting back, even though he's completely outgunned. And Galata's getting unraveled mentally. He's losing it again. He can't help himself. He just has this thing where, you know, and low, low, low. And even more so than the first fight now, like Eddie Cotton is the referee for this one. And he's like, as the boxing world already knows, they're not going to play this shit. All right. Like Galata got disqualified for landing numerous low blows. They're not about to have a riot this time or go through this stuff. They're going to take it very quickly and they're going to, you know, put this in the butt of Galata starts getting wild. So that's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's uh, as they're starting to try to go back and forth, Galata gets hurt in the toward the end of the third round. And then in the fourth round, he goes down and it's almost kind of like, oh, whoa, holy shit. You know, Riddick Bowe's waking up. But, you know, it's it's almost like it was almost like an accident, like you know, like it was almost like Bo got him on accident. And so uh, not too long after that, Galata just goes pretty much right back to what he was doing. And that was kind of like the last uh, hurrah for Bo, like, you know, that last kind of lashing out where and then from there, he just starts absorbing a beating, gets knocked down again. But then Galata, dude, it's just he can't he can't help it. He can't. Like they're sitting there going, like, you know, all right, you got this. Like, you got this in the bag, bro. Like they're literally begging him in the corner. Just box, just box. Yeah, just yeah, yeah, they're like box. Like, don't engage. Don't get in there with him. Just use your jab. Keep him on the outside because he can't touch you. Like, you don't have to do anything. But he couldn't. And I mean, it's not even like he was like, you know, you see fighters, you'll see fights where guys are like just wild. Yeah. And it's like they're mid combination and they just can't help themselves. Like, you know, I'm not trying to hit them low. It's just, you know, I'm just, I'm not fucking precise with my punches, but it was like, he was like aiming elsewhere and then just finishing up with an uppercut to the dick. And it wasn't even like on the belt line either. This was clearly right on the cuff, just right there where Bo wasn't faking it. No one could fake that. And Bo is a tough guy. Like even in some, in other fights where he was, um, you know, fouled or whatever. He might take a break, but he's not going to sit there and just, you know, all on the canvas. Like, Galato is hitting him with hard, hard punches. He's a big heavyweight squarely in the, on the cup. Like, yeah. You know. The last one's really bad. The last yeah. one's really bad. It's like a four punch combination to the cup, dude. And I no, mean, that's, oh my God, I'm still thinking about it. And like, you know, Larry Holmes, why we say, took the hardest low blow I've ever heard or saw in my life against Jerry Cooney. Um, where you use here, it, it just sounds like a water balloon dropping on the canvas. You know what I mean? And that stopped the that stopped the contest for a little bit. And, and you know, a scene I've never seen before or since, where Holmes goes in his corner and Ray Arcella's is giving him water, <laughs> and he's over there being wiped down and mad and being able to be relaxed or whatever. As Holmes took that low blow and was able to continue, I'm not sure if he would be able to like anybody would able be able to take the sustained beating to their nuts the way Galata was just whooping on bow like that, you know? And again, that, that was it. Like, you know, Galata's corner didn't protest after uh, he finally gets disqualified. No one else could because yeah. it's at that point. What else can you do? Like, this yeah, is just... And that's, and that's, the, that's what I'm saying is, like, he doesn't, like, do it and then be like, oh, fuck, you know, oh, or oops. anything. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if I, if I fuck that up, like, on accident, I'm just going to be like, oh, shit, dude fuck you know something but he was just like he knew it exactly it was wild and you know after that after the second fight you're just kind of wondering again you're like okay well this guy is clearly skilled but he's a mental basket case so i don't know where do you go because bo's fucking shot but he got two wins like what do you where do you go and that was the other thing too like where is bo gonna go from this like there was so many questions after this because bo was only 29 Keep that in mind. He wasn't even 30 yet. And he was disturbingly like looking bad. Like really, really bad. So you're just kind of like, okay, um, I don't I have no idea where this is, you know, where to go with Bo. Because Bo at first, 
he didn't sound like he wanted to retire, but then he said he wanted to do some soul searching. And out of nowhere, he decides to join the Marines. And then his whole uh, most career is basically finished after this. All right. That was that just, you know, more or less. Yeah. Bro, so if, you've of, had, if you've had discipline problems since your teens, yeah. don't join the Marines at like 30. <laughs> don't do it. And how long did he last? Like a day? I, I could have sworn it was like a couple days, but over here it said it was 10 days. I'm like, really? Was it that long? Yeah. Maybe it was. But <laughs> Even so, that's not, you know, that's a very, very small portion of boot camp. So I think that pretty quickly he learned that like, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to be like all Marvin Hagler talking about silk pajamas, getting out of bed and everything. But man, you know, if you've been heavyweight champion and you've had people kissing your fucking ass... Mm-hmm. And you've lived luxury that people, most people have never known. You've done things that people are just like, champ, you are so fucking bad. You know, you're the baddest motherfucker. And on top of that, you got credentials to back it up. And then you go into boot camp where you're just a nothing. And there's somebody screaming in your face, dude. And you're saying there's a bunch of other like melee you know, like teenagers or whatever will go in there for themselves to fight. Yeah, and you them. and you can't just whoop somebody's fucking ass even though you it's know 20. you could. Yeah. Even though you know you could just grab this motherfucker by the neck. Like, but I, of course he didn't last. You know, of course he didn't last. And on top of that, dude, you know, there's the whole psychology behind it. You know, he's trying to fix problems that were not fixable that way, dude. He thought that it was a discipline issue. It probably was at least in part a discipline issue. But now, you know, as many shows as you and I have done, as much shit as you and I have talked about, we know that those things don't happen in a vacuum. All of those fights that he took and all the sparring he did, all whatever, you know, the amateur experience, the time in the gym, that shit didn't happen in a vacuum. He was getting punched. He was receiving head trauma. And then on top of that, he had three wars with Holyfield. And then he gets the shit kicked out of him twice by Galata. You know, it's 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 tough to add up dude uh so you can't turn and that back disturbing. and it's disturbing because after that you like you hear his in- interviews soon after that and you hear like the drastic changes in his voice and how he's slurring and everything like that and you're just kind of like oh shit you know should he even still be fighting and now you get worried about, about that and soon enough you didn't even have to worry about that because his whole life spiraled out of the ring like completely um soon after he yeah, gave up that it was sad, man. It was really sad because if you ever met Riddick Bo, you'd realize he's like a big teddy bear. I had a chance to meet him once or twice. Yeah, it's like of he's times. a big kid, all smiles, he's nice dude. Very he, and he's huge, man. I got I took a photo with him one time, and it looks like I'm I, I could disappear inside his inside, like gigantic dude. But he's such a nice guy and just lovable and caring. So I feel for him for what he was going through. You know, like he did a lot of. You know, I don't know if his, if he was in the right headspace or if it was like the brain damage he was incurring or what it was, but like soon after that, like you know, he went through that thing where um, infamously he got back in the news again because he kidnapped his wife and kids. Remember that? Oh yeah, I remember. I remember that very well. Kidnapped them, and then he said he did it out of love, which was like a really odd comment. You know what I mean? And he said that like, yeah. Well, and and you know, dude there's a lot of stuff too. That's like, I mean, that's dark. Don't get me wrong. That's dark. That's not like, that's not, there's not funny thing funny about that. Not at all. A, a person kidnapping the, most situations where that happens do not end well, do not end nearly as well as it ended for his situation. Totally. Um, so thank goodness it did. Thank goodness. Nobody was harmed, you know, like that. Um, But what really sits really icky with me and not just me, a lot of people is during his trial, Riddick Bo said that it was the damage he had taken during his awesome. career that contributed. And he probably was 1000% honest in telling the truth and saying it. The problem is that what, what it, seven, eight years later, he's, yeah. he's fucking actually licensed in California too. not even like Alabama or Arkansas or fucking, you know, but California, which is supposed to be a big, robust, you know, commission that's got a lot of oversight, and he's licensed to fight in California. And then on top of that, after using the head damage as a defense to kidnapping, and then on top of that, the dude that he fought, Billy Zumbrun, had a few fights before that. One, his fight has had ended in his opponent dying. 
badly wrong. And that was just a freak accident, man. You know. Yeah, no, uh, and I'm not trying to say it's a conspiracy or nothing. Oh no, it's no, just no, that no, it no, makes no. It look I'm just saying so it's, bad. It's, oh yeah, totally. Uh, Bradley Roan was a journeyman who, um, again, been in the ring with uh, everybody you can imagine back then. And from what I heard is that he suffered a heart attack during that fight. It wasn't even anything that Zumbro did. They just had one round. Right, yeah, and he just collapsed and died right there, which is but crazy. It, it added to the added salaciousness absolutely. of yes, yes totally. Because what was Bones doing even back? I don't even know if his first fight was in Cali. His first fight... uh, Hold on, let me bring up his box right because I'm curious now. Um, Because when Bo came back, his first fight was against Marcus Rohde, I believe. You're right, yeah. He's, you know, the journeyman that everybody took a pound on back in the day. And, no, see, his first fight was actually in... Somewhere in Shawnee. You're right. I was mistaken thinking that the Zombron fight was the first one. Oklahoma. There you go, Oklahoma. So he comes back in Oklahoma, you know, knocks out a guy in two rounds, and Marcus Rohde, who everybody kicked the shit out of. And that gave California enough, you know, enough dumb shit, I guess, to be like, oh, yeah, he's totally fine. Everything's good. Awful. Just and it was awful. featured on television. Wasn't that yeah. on, like, Fox Sports or, like, the best damn sports show or whatever they used to have? I'm, yeah, I'm pretty – yeah, with Tom Arnold and his crazy yeah, fucking yeah, ass yeah. calling boxing. <laughs> the fuck is that guy doing because they used yeah. to always feature um they used to always feature james tony on those shows and then bo was coming back i watched that in college man that was two thousand. Yeah, jason robin the jason robinson fight i'm pretty sure was on that yeah i think uh the other one too against rydell booker but yeah so you know he fights billy zumber and now i'm looking that wasn't even his last fight no i didn't realize and, that and, that, and, and, later, and his last fight wasn't as his Germany. last fight wasn't his last fight either. He had that that Muay Thai fight, remember? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he got fucking fight. like just chopped in half. Of, was a cup of, cup. of course he would. But yeah, dude. So I mean, you know, I don't, I don't know what he's doing now. But the last that I saw and the last that I heard and from what I gather, it doesn't seem like he's doing super great because he's doing all sorts of crazy shit for money. Like I don't remember. I don't know if you remember that shit, but back on back of the day on Twitter, he was saying, "Give me twenty bucks and I'll tweet anything." Remember That's that? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then someone gave him up for the, the tweet about Ray Pop. <laughs> yeah, fucking what's his name? Uh, our our homeboy Jim Bag Junior was like trying to get him to say shit, and he did. Remember he did. I think you said you know Ray Pop watch. That's what's that up. That might have been him. That honestly <laughs> might have been him for real. But like, yeah, dude. Uh, you know. So, and I don't mean to make light of that either. But it's no, just, no. It's... But I mean, that was just like it, it was a sad case. And like, I don't, I don't know. It was just a lot of things happened with Bo after that. Yeah. And it's, well, and it's you think about it too, like, because no one, I can't even imagine what his family had to go through going through that type of shame. And yeah, but yeah. clearly. Even though he was allowed to come back, you gotta, you know, keep that in mind. This is boxing. People that had no business being um being sanctioned to fight still get it. Look at Wilfred Benitez. Should he have been fighting in nineteen ninety? Aaron Pryor, should he have been fighting in nineteen ninety? Um, countless other guys over the years. They had no business even being around there. Sure, half of the names that we mentioned today that were like early opponents of Riddick Bowe also made co- Bruce Selden, all these dudes were all like making comebacks and you know, like Oh yeah, oh yeah, totally. Uh uh-huh. You know? crazy but you know it's it's actually crazy too because speaking of comebacks you know you would have thought most people did like andrew what is finished like what oh, yeah fuck? totally he's never accomplishing anything he'll never make it on to tv again you know he bit a guy he fucking got disqualified twice for low blows you know this guy's fucking done for nah not in boxing bitch <laughs> fucking TV, get chance after chance after fucking chance he is the thing he is the thing like I, you know, you don't want to bring race into it, but Galato was white. I mean, it was popular. And then, two, even though he was DQ'd twice against Bo, he looked amazing in those fights right. still. Exactly. You know, like, he was still rated as one of the best in the, the division. And no one had really had those type of skills. Like, you was, you know, you still knew that the potential yeah, was. Because people knew better, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, Bo got those wins, but people knew they could use their eyes, well, you know? You know, it was, it was easy to still get excited about Galato because, like, even though he did that, you still wanted to watch him because you knew he was skilled. So, um, I even remember soon after this, after the after the the bow fights, they had a thing where they did like a computerized tournament through each division. You know the the top fucking you know five or six guys or whatever, right? Sure. Guess who? Won the, guess who won the heavyweights? Galata. They said Galata would have been the undisputed champion. They had him knocking out Tyson. They had him beating Holyfield. They had him knocking out Lennox Lewis. Like Galata ran through the entire division. 
So this is how people were, I mean, you know, how some of the public, not all of it, some of the public perception was that Galato was a really skilled guy. And when he fought Lennox Lewis for the WBC title at this point, Lewis, you know, this was one of those fights too that you weren't sure what's going to happen. Unforgettable look on his face at the end. Oh my God, yeah. And so like, and so this fight, you know, the, the Lennox Lewis fight was wild in itself because Galato was coming off of two losses where he got DQ'd in both of them. And like the controversy was sky high with this dude. Lennox Lewis had come through two crazy fucking affairs himself. All right. To become champion first, poor Oliver McCall, you know, had a nervous breakdown in the ring because Don King, you know, gentleman that he is, decided to um, take McCall from. Pull either, him out of rehab. Yeah. Pull him out of rehab and throw him into a title fight. McCall Literally had, pull him out of a rehab. Hey, you need to fight him. McCall. Yeah. So. That's still to this day, man. To watch that so fight, good. and then you see George Benson, not George Benson, Jesus, George Benton, who at that point had moved on to main events and became kind of a, um, a Don King guy, sitting there in the corner just looking absolutely disgusted, you know? And you make Just watching him. Yep, he's yeah. just watching him walk back and forth and going. And he's just sitting there, and he's just like, what the fuck am I involved with? And he's just like, you know. There's like nothing he can do. And a couple of points you see him reach out and try to grab him. And like McCall just walks by and he's just like, you know, this is a dude who like went through the fiasco in the second Leon Spanks fight. It wasn't a person who tolerated bullshit. And he's older at this point. So at this, you know, he's probably thinking to himself, like, I like, I don't, you know. But so that's what that. And then Lennox Lewis in his next fight had to fight Henry Akinwande, which again is one of those awkward, weirdest, ridiculous, stupid oh. you know. Oh God, dude. Thank, thank Mills Lane for ending that because that was just. And poor Mills, man. I mean, like we we talked about him before in the, when we did our little tribute to him, how it was always funny to see how small he was when he would jump between the heavyweights because it was got let go, let go, <laughs> let go. He's, he's like. He's like this little like Yoda character in between Akinwande, who was a giant. And Lewis, who's a you know giant himself, and he's just just like get out, get out, get out, get out, get out, get out let go. Like, and he won't. He yes. won't let go. Like, so, what the fuck. That's what we were going into with this fight, man. You had Galata coming off of his two fights, and you had Lewis coming off of two wild fights himself, where you're just like, well, what's going to happen here? And that, that's one of my favorite pay per view cards because you have Gotti and uh, Gabriel That was the main uh, undercard attraction. That fight will stand the test of time as one of the best you know you can watch from that era but um a lot of people forget lennox had that main events involvement for a couple of years there he did oh yeah yeah because main events and panics right yeah they were kind of like in doing their thing so um yeah so for that fight though i just i remember tell me if you remember this too pat there was already controversy before the fight wasn't it that galata hadn't shown up to the arena yet and it was like getting eerily close and they weren't sure if he was going to show up or what the hell was happening or, like, there was something going on there where there was, like, Galata hadn't shown up, but there was some kind of controversy going on. They didn't know what was going on or if Galata was even going to show up. But he finally did at, like, super-duper late time. And God. at this point, I still believed in Galata. I haven't gone up front, even though it had been almost a year since he had fought. Like, I thought the skills that he exhibited in the Bows fights were going to beat Lewis because I still wasn't – I still, and myself, and I'm not sure if anyone else was, was still, like, totally believing in Lewis yet. You know, he had boy was completely washed and wasn't going to do a thing with Lewis anyways. And he didn't look amazing in either, you know, in the McCall fight or the Akinwande fight, no fault of his own. But I mean, you know, the momentum I thought was with Galata. And instead, you know, Lewis bludgeoned him in one round, <laughs> like badly. And that's what you mean by that face, because the first time Galata goes down, his eyes are almost bulging up at his head like he just got shell-shocked. You know what I mean? In the video game, he's like... And- and I think that it was like he got um what was it? He got um the Tyson fight was he broke a vertebrae, but the the Lewis fight was something else. I can't remember what it was, but something he like Lewis like he got some other injury uh during well, the he Lewis. He was taken fight. out on a stretcher afterwards. I think he either had an anxiety attack or something happened to him, but there was a photo of him after the fight on a stretcher. I can't remember <laughs> what it was, but he got some some injury from the Lewis fight too. And so it was like, I mean, looking in context, it, it, you could obviously see why he was so like vilified, but it was like, it was, 
you know, it, he was getting legitimate injuries in these fights where it was like, yeah, like he's got his ass kicked, but you don't get any, you've already burned your goodwill, bro. You've already cried wolf too many times. Like you've already hit the dude in the nuts and bit the other guy. So it, it doesn't matter, you know, how tough you look getting your ass kicked. You're done now, bro. So yeah, he, against Lennox Lewis, that was Lewis's first real kind of like monster moment. Yes. Where he came out and was just like, fuck this, and just beat the shit out of Galata. And at that point, everyone was like, oh, no. Like, you didn't know what was going to happen to Galata after that. Like, was he done? I mean, you know, you knew that when he came back, he'd probably get a TV date somewhere. But in terms of him being at the Elite, everyone thought that was it. Like, not only was he erratic and, you know, clearly not well in the head that he can, like, perform to his fullest abilities in the ring – um but he just got washed against lennox lewis badly so like what is he gonna do to his credit he did come back you know a few months later he and he, it had to be slow like he fought a a select you know number of journeymen and stuff and um one fight that was pretty memorable at that time was against a guy by the name of uh cory sanders not the one not the former wbo champion who knocked out uh klitschko but t-rex t-rex a big, burly heavyweight, not very skilled, but just a giant of a human himself. And they put on a bloody, memorable fight on Tuesday Night Fights. Yeah. And another fighter who they let fight way too long after his eye was like dead and clouded over and they're still right. letting him fight. What the fuck are they thinking? Hey, boxing, you guys are crazy. But yeah, Did you, you didn't buy that pay-per-view of him sparring Tyson, did you? I didn't buy it, but I saw it. <laughs> and th they did that like two or three times too. Did they? Yeah. Oh, shit, I don't even know. I, it was only a pay per view once, but they did okay, sparring okay. exhibitions like three, two or three times. Like, but yeah, so you know, he's he's like beating guys like uh, Corey Sanders, Tim Witherspoon, who was completely washed at this point, um, Jesse Ferguson, which was on HBO, you know, and fights like that. So by the end of the nineties, now, um, really near the end of the nineties, we're talking November of ninety nine. Galata had built himself back enough that he was given a slot, probably his last chance too, as, as people wanted to look at it, against Michael Grant. And Michael Grant at that point was the poster child of H, was one of the poster childs of HBO, um, was looked upon to be in, you know, the heir of the heavyweight division. And um, yeah, you, you know, the hype for Grant was at his zenith in 99, dude. Like everybody was hyped about Grant. I, I certainly was. I wasn't the biggest fan of him. I found him kind of boring, but like, you know, everybody was salivating about this dude. He was big. He, he was athletic. He could he looked like he had the tools. And every time he was featured on HBO at this point, he had beaten the shit out of his opponent pretty well. So Galata, um, to his credit, probably put on the best performance of his career outside of the bullfights. You know, one of the best at, at the, up to that point. And what made it even more better was that he didn't, like, as far as I remember, I don't think he didn't revert to, like, any, you know, fouling or anything like that. You know what I mean? Like, he dropped Grant yeah. twice early on and, for the most part, was outboxing Grant, like, you know, beating him up. Like, it was a good fight. But the thing about Galata, again, and the thing that's always been a drawback about him is, you know, guys showing resistance. Grant, for all of his faults, and we find out he had a lot more faults after this, had a tremendous heart. He did. Like, he would, you know, always get up and try to fight back. And he had to get up in this one. He got dropped hurt. He was beat up and... He kept on coming back, though, and slowly he was inching his way back into the fight, and Galata was faltering. And by the time Grant finally broke through and dropped Galata, what was it, like round 10? Um, and that was, you know, another thing, too, where they were like, we got to have to wipe him off after this. Galata quit. You know, he gets up, and he asked, and the referee asked him, yo, do you want to continue? You want to continue? And he said straight up, he said, no. He's like, no. Yeah, he's like, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's just such a peculiar fellow, dude. And <laughs> And and then it's like you keep the guy's nine lives, dude. He's a fucking cat because you yeah. keep thinking, all right, that's it. Like you know, he's you know he he gave a good account of himself finally, but he lost, you know, and he lost. Because he guy quit, and if he didn't quit, he probably could have won that fight because he was still winning at all points. You know, he he lost to a guy who's up and coming, and for the most part, somewhat unproven, looks the part, but is obviously shaky, as we now know, obviously in hindsight. But, you know, that's that should have been it for for all anybody knows that should have been pretty much it. But he somehow winds up getting he you know, beats Marcus Rohde and then he uh, gets a win over Orlin Norris, who's like, you know, the smallest heavyweight on the face of the planet at this point. But, you know, is a little overweight, should be a cruiserweight, but has gained a little bit of weight and facing heavyweights generally losing. But like, you know, he, he fine. That's fine. You know, he gets a win over Orlin Norris and he somehow gets positioned to take on Mike Tyson in Mike Tyson's continued 
fucking lunatic fringe <laughs> comeback. You know, he's already he's tried to like. Rip... So Mike is at his like absolute wits end. Yeah, of he's trying like these fucking people trying to put him on lithium, and he's just like, no, <laughs> he's just fucking trying by to 2000, rip. By two thousand, Mike Tyson. Um, you know, after let's see, what, what was his career after the after the second Holyfield fight? He tried to break Andrew Galato's arm. Not Galato, excuse me. He tried to break up. Uh, yeah, he Holyfield. tried to. Yeah, he tried to <laughs> rip both his arm off. He tried to rip both his arm off. The the guy you just mentioned, Orlin Norris, gets punched after the bell and dislocates his knee or something and, like that. And Lou Savarese, remember that? He's going after Lou Savarese, like the most forgettable fight ever. And then like he's going after Lou Savarese because it ends so abruptly that he's like, I want more. And he's like going around the referee. And then he goes and knocks just... down the referee and attacks him, stuff like that. Julius Francis gets decked. I mean, that one was just, you know, underwhelming. Nothing really of note happened there. But this is this was the Tyson that we were going through at this point. And when they when he was matched up with Galata, it was almost like the pay-per-view was like being billed as, you know, like a freak show, so or less. You know what I mean? You know, like you just knew something yeah, crazy. Anything could fucking happen. Yeah. Like you had Galata who was known for his low blows and his other craziness, and you had Tyson who bit off a fucking ear already. So <laughs> like they were, you know, this was for this was for the ghouls. This is for the hooligans. This is for like, you know, the freaks of the of the sport who want to watch something crazy happen. And we all sat there drooling about it. I certainly did. I was hyped, you know? Well, we pretty much got it. I mean, we got exactly what we were fucking asking for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, not like there was no riot or like any fouling or anything crazy. Tyson just went out there and beat him up. <laughs> you yeah, know, like, he, really he caught him with a really good shot. I think it was a right hand. Yes. And, it, and, uh, and that was what I was talking about earlier, where Galata actually wound up with a fractured vertebrae that was like fractured in a really strange way where, and I don't know how true this is, but they were trying to say, you know, that if it had, if, if the fight had gone on or if he had moved a certain way, it could have gone into his spinal column and killed him. And, you know, I, maybe, I don't know. I'm not a fucking orthopedist, but the point is he got legitimately injured, but yeah. it was like, he got injured, but kept fighting on because he didn't know he was injured. And, mm -hmm. but it was like, then after the second round, he just, you know, pulled a fucking lunatic move again. And everybody's like, what the fuck? And he quits. And then, you know, so people are going, Jesus Christ, like Galata again. And then Mike tests positive for weed. <laughs> <laughs> That's some shit I would have done. Like, do it, will a fight still get changed to a no contest today if someone tests positive for weed? Depends on the state because some states have, uh, because of the decriminalizing, some states have also taken it off of their banned substance list. Okay. But, um, yeah, that was just an odd thing. And, of course, you know, the most memorable part of that fight was that at this point, Galadar had moved on from main events and he had um, teamed up with old school trainer Al Serto, who was not a guy who took bullshit or gruff or anything from anybody. In fact, he was the first one to throw bullshit at you. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, he wanted his fighters to fight. Most, you know, the guy he was most known for handling was Buddy McGirt, but he was just an old school Italian dude who had mob ties. And, like, this is the guy that fucked around. You know what I mean? <laughs> and after... huh? Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, go ahead. But like, you know, it's the, the, that, that scene where Galata goes, no, no, like he wants to quit. He's like, I don't want to fight anymore. And you see Serto, God, no, motherfucker, you're going to fight. You kidding me? Get this. this yeah, he's trying to shove his fucking mouthpiece <laughs> in there. Yeah. He's like, get that in there. God damn it, Andrew, you're going to fight. <laughs> and he's shoving him and Galata's like, yeah, no. Yeah, like he's doing oh, everything like short of literally fucking weekend at Bernie's his ass and like make it fighting for him to because he's like dude please don't do this but of course like I said to give you know Galata some credit here he legitimately had a fucked up injury and probably should not have gone out and Mike Tyson was raring to kill him like Mike Tyson wanted to kill him he was like I'm gonna fuck kill this guy so you know what's crazy though bro is that after that and again once again we reach a okay Galata's done no, he's not. And what the crazy shit is, is that this is maybe the most respectable portion of Galata's career, even Absolutely. though he did not get any of these wins, except for, you know, he gets totally obliterated in that one fight. But the two fights before that, he fought like the two most respectable fights he's ever fought, dude. Like, you know, he, he did. He wasn't suspected to do any of that. And so should like, have won both of them, in my opinion. Yes. Oh, Totally. So, like you said, Pat, he takes a break now, the longest one of his career, because people think after the Tyson fiasco, this is it. We're never going to see him again. And why would we? You know what I mean? After something like that. Yeah, happened, nobody wanted to. Oh, you know, how many labs are you going to give this dude? But 
you know, this is boxing. If you can still get uh, blood out of a stone, you'll do it, right? And um, there was a few years that Don King still sees money in him. He was like, oh, yeah, it's been a few years since Tyson fiasco. And at this point, you know, Tyson was basically on, on the way out. There was, Lewis was still champion, but he was slowing down a little bit. And Don still had at this, even though it was the early 2000s, Don started losing his, like, grasp in boxing. At this point, around 2003, 2002, excuse me, um, 2004, he still had like the majority of guys in the heavyweight division. He still had Chris Bird. He still had John Ruiz. He had, you know, I think he was still dealing with Rockman. He had like ties and other guys. So like, yeah. you know, King had his, King still had his way. And Nolan Galata, who still could be popular, even though he was such a fuck up, would, he still saw money in him. And that's why he was able to, after only two wins against mediocre opposition, including Terrence Lewis, was able to slot him in against Chris Bird at Madison Square Garden. And when that fight happened, I'm sure you'll agree with me. No one thought that was gonna anything would happen with that. That was just gonna be an afterthought that Bird would whoop him. Because at that point, Bird was the um, IBF champion, and even though even though Bird was slowing down a little bit, like he wasn't the, the fast mover he was that we saw him around the Ike Bayabuchi fighter before that. You know, he's more stationary at this point. He was still like a very slick fighter who wasn't supposed to get struggle against a guy like Galata, who had been basically inactive for the past three years. And instead, like you said, Galata put on the performance of his career. Yeah, he he, in my opinion, definitely should have won that fight from like a you know nine three eight four in rounds yeah, type yeah. of type of win. Um, but I mean, excuse me from from a Don King perspective, Lennox Lewis was was uh, he had let's see, gosh, when was this? So he wouldn't have he either would have just retired, I think, because I want to say he retired in March of two thousand four. Or something like that, but in any point, or in any rate, like before this, Lennox Lewis, the heavyweight champion, but Don King still has enough pull among the sanctioning bodies, and he's hammering these motherfuckers to release belts because there's not, you know, mandatories being fulfilled or whatever. And then uh, Lennox Lewis voluntarily voluntarily gives up the IBF belt because he's like Chris Bird. Yeah. What? Like, what do you mean? And I mean, yeah, dude, it. it Chris Bird was skilled, but I think the consensus was Lennox Lewis probably would have beaten the crap out of him, you know, down the hall, down the stretch. But, you know, I'm not going to give him credit for a win he didn't <laughs> get and a person he didn't fight. But the point is, you know, these titles have now been dispersed again, despite the fact that Lennox Lewis is the champion, which opens up these possibilities. So Chris Bird being the IBF title holder or whatever, he's looking pretty good against these mostly the contenders of yesteryear, the champions of yesteryear type of shit who are a little bit washed or aren't as fast as him and aren't favorable style matchups, but still, still a skilled guy, still expected to defeat someone like Galata, who is, you know, even in yesteryear, he couldn't get the fucking win. So Galata comes in and beats the crap out of him for several rounds, actually. You know, and like I said, I thought he won that fight. A lot of people thought he won that fight, but from Don's King, Don King's perspective, I think had a lot more. Uh, he felt he probably could control Chris Bird a little bit better. Not saying that he got him that win, but or uh, or or that he got him that draw, I should say. But Chris Bird didn't win that fight by any stretch. Um, but yeah, he he looked good, way better than anybody thought he'd look. And then of course. Uh, I think is some somewhat of a consolation. Like, okay, you probably should have beaten Chris Bird and you got the draw, so you we're gonna put you in with John Ruiz now. And John Ruiz was the guy that people were like, I, well, I won't speak for everybody. I'll speak for myself, but I was absolutely salivating for him to go away. Please, you know, we all were. What's that? I'll speak for everybody else. We all were. And it wasn't our personality. I did not know one single fan of his should not have won the belt in the first place and then should have lost the fucking third fight outright. Holy deal. Yeah. Jesus. But like, you know, so fine, whatever. And it, I think a lot of people thought like, all right, well, Galata, that's it now. You know, like, this is your final fucking chance, bro. It. And then he goes in and beats John Ruiz and loses the decision. Like, dude. The guy, he got screwed. He should have been a unified titleist at this point. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, he got he, screwed. Like, he dropped Ruiz twice and beat him up. Like, Ruiz was just a mauling, gross, yeah. whatever. It was a weird fight. Yeah, Ruiz that. didn't do shit. The only thing that was memorable about that was the 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 beef between um, Randy Newman and um, Ruiz's trainer there, uh, Stoney. 
<laughs> oh, what a piece of shit you turned out to be. <laughs> Just going what did out. I say? I didn't say nothing. And then, like, you know, Newman, who was a former pro, was a former pro heavyweight himself, who fought like a list of good fighters back in the day, and would have beat the shit out of Stone if Stone had tried to do anything with him. Um, even told him, like, he was calm there. I got to give Newman credit. He was calm during the whole time. He didn't like lose his cool or nothing. He just warned him. He was like, who you know. Was it, who was it that it was Alton Murkerson? Oh, gave, Alton Murkerson, gave, Alton Murkerson <laughs> gave Stoney the two piece, bro. Yeah. He'd be done. Yeah, he gave him the hands, man. He gave him the beats. And- <laughs> Afterwards, that was the that was the disturbing image of after Stoney getting knocked out like that. He shaved his head for some reason. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and he's got like a band aid on his head. He has like pimples guy. all over. Yeah, it was it was awful. So um, Jesus Christ. But yeah, um, the Ruiz fight. Yeah, Stoney he gets into argument with Newman. They're going back and forth, and then Newman threw him out. And you see like you know like a wrestling thing. You see a manager getting thrown out of the ring. Get out of here. And you follow him back into the locker room, and Stoney is still going crazy. Fuck that ref! That bullshit! And then when you see Ruiz get the decision, you see Stoney. Yes, it's so like <laughs> it, it. At some point, they cut to Stoney, who's sitting in the in the dressing room watching the fight, yeah. and he goes, "This guy, I didn't say nothing to this guy. I didn't do nothing." And it's like, bro, you just literally walked into his face and said you're a piece of shit. And they literally probably told him, "All right, Stoney, we'll put the camera on you right now. Tell us what you feel." <laughs> like wowzers! No, it was. That was a fiasco, dude, and uh, you know it was one of those Don- another one of those kind of like hyped Don King cards, and but that really was, uh, you know, that seemed to be again, once again, the last chance, and then he gets thrown in with Layman Brewster, and dude, there was it was so weird because Layman Brewster, who had defeated Vladimir Klitschko in a fight where Klitschko just like collapsed and looked strange and weird, so people were like, dude, Layman Brewster just got the shit kicked out of him and won that fight, so what do we expect from him, you know, like. Galata just won these two other fights and got fucked. So he's probably going to kick Lehman Brewster's ass. So, of course, they schedule that shit in Chicago because this is going to be Galata's big thing. You know, he's going to beat the shit out of Lehman Brewster now in Chicago in front of a shitload of Polish fans. <laughs> so they bring out a bunch of Polish fans in Chicago at the fucking, what's it called? The United, the United Center in Chicago. It's a full joint. And Galata just gets obliterated, <laughs> like just fucking obliterated. And it, the place is like stunned. Oh yeah, dude, that wasn't like you said. That wasn't really supposed to happen. Brewster, at that point, like you said, he he waited till um, Klitschko beat him down until he somehow collapsed and you know fell. Yeah, he fell. already had the eye issues. Yeah, that was really strange. Really, really strange fight. But then his very next fight too, he fights a guy named Cali Meehan, who was a tough guy but not highly skilled. And he went life and death with him. Like, it was a really good fight, but a fight that a lot of people, like, you know, if you're a champion, you should not be going life and death with a guy like this. Yeah. And so it made you think. You're like, oh, well, okay. Like, you know, Brewster. And Brewster, yeah, where before, are we? <laughs> inconsistencies. All right. Like, you know, it felt like he became champion on a fluke. And before that, like, he was outboxed by Charles Schuford. He was beat up by Clifford Atien. Yeah. Like, he had knocked over a lot of guys and looked impressive doing so. But, like, you thought, you know, Anybody worth a scratch was probably going to beat him, but nah. Instead, Brewster turned in his Mike early '80s Mike Tyson, you know, impersonation over there and blew Galata the fuck away. Like, right, like, you know, Brewster, who he was always a fast starter, so I'll say that. But like, you know, if you were able to contain him early on, like with a jab or something like that, he would shut down sparring mode. Yeah, yeah, right away. And Galata didn't do anything. Galata, if anything, looked absolutely shocked that Brewster came out of him so suddenly like that. You know what I mean? And just came boom, 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 boom. And before you knew it, a lot of just got, you know, flatlined really quickly. Three knockdowns in less than a minute. <laughs> yeah, dude. And, you know, it's, amazingly, he still continued after that. But yeah, that was that pretty was, much it. For that was it's just, yeah, yeah. It's, it's so crazy because I think that that result, though, even just that result threw up so much like upheaval, dude. Because, like I said, Galata should have defeated two of the titleists. And then the guy who everyone doesn't think much of just kicked his ass. What do we do? Like, where are we? What What's going on here? You know, so that's that's kind of what wound up happening. Um, but for Galata's part, that was it. That was his last kind of big effort or or whatever. And the the only thing that they really tried to guide him toward after that was, was showdowns with Tomas Adamek, who was, you know, pretty much at the height of his popularity in 2008, 2009, and just beat the crap out of Galata and then Salida Primusaw Salida 
who, you know, uh, same thing. He was uh, in, oh, I wasn't even up and coming in 2013. He had already had his share of losses, but he was a big, uh, a big attraction in Poland. And so matching them up was good shit. It was just that, yeah, dude, Galato was absolutely washed by this point. Yeah, man, getting stopped by a guy like Ray Austin, Adamek wasn't that bad of a loss because Adamek was a good fighter. But like, yeah, Galato at that point was just being trumped around as, you know, as a whatever. And had he beat Ray Austin, actually, because I was, you know, he had a couple more fights after that. Like he fought Kevin McBride at MSG, which was the first fight I ever attended at MSG. And um, Galata still had the, fan, the fans there. I remember when I was walking to the arena, you saw all the people in the red and the white bandanas and everything going crazy. Yeah, they were hyped. You know what I mean? Galata was still there, dude, even though he was an absolute mental case. But by the time, you know, he uh, he loses to Ray Austin, that was it. Like, had he won that fight, because um, he was, Ray Austin was always a king lifer himself. I'm sure Don King would have found a way to, like, you know, weasel Galata into one more title shot somewhere, somehow, but, yeah. <laughs> nah, he just didn't have it, dude. And, I mean, I have absolutely no idea what the guy is up to these days. Couldn't tell you, honestly. Um, so I hope he's okay. I mean, he, he definitely had an, an eventful career. That's for sure. Totally. And, you know, and he's remembered, fond- like, I don't know if he's remembered fondly today, but he's definitely remembered for his theatrics and, you know, the, what happened in the nineties with him. You know what I mean? He played an integral part in the heavyweight division at one time. And at one time, a lot of people were really excited for his potential too, even though he had all those faults, but his two fights were both will just go down in history. Um, for just being some of the most chaotic and um, I don't know, wildest uh, moments that you can imagine in the sport, but like that kind of sums up boxing in general, I guess. You know what I mean? (laughs) Perfect. Absolutely perfect. You just laid it out right for me, bro. Look, boxing throughout hundreds of years, right? Boxing has been such a great encapsulator for society and, and the shit going on in society. Uh, if whether it's holding a mirror to society or whether, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's life imitating art or art. I don't have no fucking clue. All I know is that uh, <laughs> many of these kinds of fights, especially in the 90s, were they fit perfectly in their time. And these two fights, same, absolute same. They reflect exactly the things that were going on in the U.S. culture at the time and with media and whatnot. And uh, I think they really captured moments of the both of these fighters careers where they were like you know uh definitely at, at a sort of crossroads but very interesting for sure and entertaining absolutely. no question absolutely yeah man hey but, hey dude i appreciate you you're doing your homework bro that's for you man it's always a blast reminiscing on these fights <laughs> yeah for sure man it's it's good to come back again and do another show in 2023 And I'm excited for another big year, bro. And everybody who listened in, thank you. So we appreciate you. Whatever podcast app you are using to listen in, go ahead and rate us, uh, leave a review. We appreciate that stuff. Also, if you watched on YouTube, hello and thank you. Thank you so much. Subscribe, leave a comment, and we'll try to say hello as well. As far as social media goes, the Knuckles and Gloves podcast is on both Facebook and Instagram. But we're also on Twitter for the, at least the time being. And also individually, we're on Twitter. My buddy Eris Pina is on Twitter as Punch Zone Eris. I'm there as Patrick M. Connor. We'll say hi, man. Eris, take it easy, bro. Have a good one, y'all. Yeah.